Okay, I'm going to uh, call the 1 p.m. meeting of the Finance Committee of May 27, 2021 to order. Um, just uh, for those who are watching, and uh, there are actually two Finance Committee meetings posted today. There's a second meeting posted for 5.30 p.m., which is going to focus on the uh, social services part of the budget that has to do with the community um, responder program. That is a separate meeting and separate agenda. Uh, this meeting um, is being held by remote participation pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 38, Section 18. And uh, so, um, I want to start by just making sure that um, each member of the Finance Committee can hear and be heard for, so that we can establish uh, for the record that um, all members of the committee can participate. So um, starting with Lynn. Present. Uh, Pat. Present. Bob? Present. Kathy? Here. Uh, Bernie? Here. And uh, I'm here. And Dorothy? I can hear you. Okay, we can hear you, thank you. So I think that we have uh, counted for all members of the committee. So um, just to review the agenda really quickly and then tell you what I'm proposing to do with the uh, consent of, of the committee is that we will begin with budget review um, of four sections of the budget that are listed on the agenda, planning, inspections, conservation and public health. Um, and uh, I am proposing that um, the vice chair that section of this meeting so that I can get a little bit of relief and not have to chair um, two long meetings in their entirety. And uh, I had spoken to Kathy this morning and uh, um, she's uh, uh, agreeable to, to doing that. So um, if there's no objection, I will go forward with that plan. Um, afterwards, um, I will ask Kathy to make sure to see if there's any public comment regarding that portion of the budget. Then we will get into a discussion of a separate matter that was referred to the committee and um, that's the reparations uh, discussion. And uh, some of the presenters of the reparations request will be joining the meeting later. And I believe that the plan is that they will, uh, that Athena will bring them into the meeting when we reach that portion of the budget and that they're gonna initially join the meeting uh, as attendees and then be brought in uh, to the meeting at the appropriate um, point when we reach that part of the schedule of the agenda. Um, the one other thing that I hope we get just a couple minutes to talk about um, before we adjourn the, this session of the meeting is to just make sure that we, have, we all understand what the plan is to complete our work as a committee in making recommendations to the council. So, um, and I will be asking for public comment again about um, the reparations section, but I will ask that that be held as a um, separate section of public comment as we sometimes do at various committee and council meetings. Um, so with that, and if there's no objection, I am turning the meeting over to Kathy. All right. Here I am. I am now your okay. acting. I'm acting chair for the, the first part of this. Um, and I just, Sean, do you did did you already have the lineup? Is it what 
uh, Andy said planning, then inspections and conservation and public health. Would it, which order? Yeah, would um, yes, planning, or, sorry, it's conservation, planning, <laughs> and then inspection services, but Dave may want to switch that up. I, if I could, Kathy, I, I sure. think I think we were going to go with the, I think it was the original, which was planning, inspection services, and then conservation. That's, um, yeah, that's. Yeah, and if I could, uh, Kathy, when you're ready, I'd just like to make a, just a brief introductory statement. Absolutely, you're on. Good. Well, great. Thank you all for having us uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm happy to be here with, with our building commissioner, Rob Mora, and our planning director, Christine Brestrup. Um, as always, we're, uh, we're happy to be here to talk about the programs that we oversee, the committees we work with, and uh, the community projects that uh, we're undertaking now and, and hope to undertake uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, as always, um, you know, our goal is, uh, our goals are many, but our goals are to support the, uh, the town manager's goals that uh, the council has given uh, uh, Paul. And, um, you know, uh, there are many goals and, and we are excited to be part of, of so many uh, community projects that make Amherst a better place for people to work, uh, live and visit. Um, as we look at the various departments we're going to talk about this morning or this afternoon, um, you know, clearly there are, are some major categories, and I think Rob and Christine and I will try to uh, zero in on those in our brief comments. But um, um, one of the major features of, of uh, the, the next fiscal year and work we're doing this fiscal year as well is is zoning reform. As most of you know, we are working uh, very hard with the planning board and the CRC. And, um, and of course the council on uh, improving our, our zoning bylaw. And that will continue to be a focus in FY22. Um, as, as Paul's budget indicated, uh, you know, a major focus of, 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 of FY22 uh, will be assisting the community to recover from the impacts of, of the pandemic. And that will take many forms and it is across the organization. Uh, and, and the work that we do in our functional area will focus on uh, things like uh, increasing the stock of affordable housing. You know about the East Street School and the Belchertown Road Project. We'll be working with the colleges and the university to help them recover and help them as, as they are an integral part of our, our community and our, our recovery is dependent on their recovery. We're working closely with the bid in the chamber on many initiatives downtown and throughout the community, uh, trying to make the business community and the, the uh, the uh, climate for restaurants and small businesses to thrive. So that'll be a major focus in, in FY22. Um, and working on community development in general, community projects like North Common, Pomeroy Village Center, we've got tremendous momentum. Uh, we certainly, uh, during the pandemic year, uh, we have been very busy and we wanna take advantage of the, all the projects that we have in the pipeline. There'll be many grant opportunities, both at the state and federal level, and we are poised to take advantage of, of those, uh, those opportunities as they're presented to us. And then finally, an overarching theme is really sustainability and resiliency. Um, we will be working you know, very closely and, and awaiting all the, uh, the good work of the ECAC uh, through the Climate Action Plan. Um, and all of our work will encompass um, sustainability and resiliency throughout the work we do. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Christine to talk about uh, planning initiatives and, and what's, what's, what's to come. Thank you. Kathy? Yes. Are you ready for me? Oh, I am. Absolutely. Hey. I'm, right. I'm, I'm happy to have this just flow. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, I'm Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'd like to tell you about the work of and the budget of the Planning Department and what we've been doing and what we're planning to do in the future. We have five staff members, including a senior planner who is 50% funded by the Community Development Block Grant. Um, we have two uh, staff planners, an administrative assistant, and myself, the Planning Director. We share a permanent administrator with the Inspection Services Department. In 2020, we hired a planner to replace an employee, who, an employee who had left in 2019, and our new planner is a big boon to our staff. He has a master's degree in regional planning. He's smart, energetic, technically proficient, and an excellent creative and productive member of our team. 
Currently, we've been working on zoning amendments, as Dave mentioned, um, and we've been working with the CRC and the planning board. In January, we were given a list of priorities that the town council felt needed to be worked on. And since then, we've been um, diligently working away at them. Planning department staff has been drafting amendments and presenting them to the planning board and the CRC. And we're in the process of bringing these zoning amendments to town council and scheduling public hearings with the planning board and the CRC. At the end of 2020, we completed um, an ADA transition plan, Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan with the help of consultants looking at how to make buildings and facilities in Amherst more accessible to people with disabilities. And we're now working with the facilities department and DPW to figure out how to make improvements that are called for in the plan. We're also working with Sean Mangano on that. Um, we're continuing to plan for downtown Amherst and we hope that our request for money to hire a planning consultant will be granted to help us in that regard. We've been working on the North Common project, as you well know, and on a wayfinding signage project. And we hope to be working with the bid on their initiatives, such as a parking structure and a performing arts show. We're working to complete the Kendrick Park playground and the dog park project. And in addition, we've worked with the Department of Public Works to apply for and receive a $1.5 million grant from the state to rebuild the Pomeroy Lane intersection. We've also applied for and received grants from MassDOT to aid the town in recovery from the pandemic, including two grants that were used to support outdoor dining and improvements to the area around the Bang Center, including a new ramp going down from the parking lot down to the Musanti Health Center. Coming out of the COVID pan pandemic, we're uh, seeing an uptick in activity related to permitting of new projects, and we'll be working with the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals to review these projects. So there's a lot going on here, and um, I'd be happy to answer your questions or uh, fill in any information that I uh, didn't manage to get in that little presentation. Dave, if it's all right with you, will we do questions after each of these? So questions first of Chris. Yes. Sure, that's fine. And and just so everyone, it's easier for me to look at the screen with faces so I can see if you do this with your hand than to pull up the hands. Um, so I know, Bernie, you had prepared some questions that I think had been sent in advance. So I didn't know whether you'd like to lead off with questions you had. But we, uh, for those who are listening, we finance, everyone in finance took some sections of the budget to particularly focus on. So this was Bernie, right? Yeah, did um, did the folks get copies of this or? Yes, and, and I can bring them up on the screen if you okay. want. That's, that's fine because I, I think, you know, Chris began to uh, address uh, some of what, um, you know, some of, some of the, the, the uh, questions that I raised. Um, but uh, there's a, a couple of things that are happening that are, are a little esoteric, one of them being the flood insurance maps, Chris, and I was just wondering where um, uh, is that project is, how close that project is to completion and whether those maps are gonna exceed the uh, FEMA requirements. Um, those maps are well on their way to being completed. Um, we recently ran into a little um, glitch on the part of um, the map that um, causes one quadrant of the town to need to be looked at more carefully. So we had predicted that we would be bringing the maps to the town council sometime this summer. It looks like it's gonna be a little bit later than that, but it's just that one map that's um, a little bit, that needs a little bit more work. So we're hoping that within the next nine months to a year, we will have a set of completed maps. And oh, what was the fine. second part of the question? Well, uh, in terms of, are, are, are these going to, um, are, are these, I'm hoping these will exceed what FEMA usually does. They are what FEMA requires because our consultant yeah. has been working closely with FEMA. Okay. Okay, I, I can see the raised hands for Bob, if you raise your hand, because Dorothy had hers up also. So I just, um, but I don't want to interrupt the, so do we want to, does anyone That's have a follow up on the- My on question was specific to the maps. Okay. So the question I have is, are you going to limit yourself to the 100 year floodplain or are you going to go higher than that? Um, the reason I ask is I've done a lot of work in hurricane recovery and 
most recently, the storms that have hit the United States have been more rainfall events than wind events. And a lot of 500 year floodplains have been um, realized. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering what, where you're gonna sort of draw the line. Well, our maps do show the 100 year floodplain and the 500 year floodplain. Okay. Um, and that's what's required by FEMA. And these are really flood insurance rate maps. So they're geared towards defining the 100 year floodplain so people know whether they need to buy flood insurance or not. So we pretty much have to live within their guidelines. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any follow up on the issue of the floodplains? Uh, not seeing any. Um, do Bernie, you had a whole long series, but you want me to take Dorothy's right now? I, I did. We we can mix this up, and some of these okay. will I can okay, just Dorothy. some of these can just go by the board depending on how we. Okay, Dorothy. Um, this is in reference to the uh, parking structure. Um, I was misquoted in the paper today. I said abutters will be part of the process. I'm I'm sure I said abutters should be, or I hope they will be. And I realized that I don't, and I've gotten some letters, um, emails um, as of yesterday on this topic. I don't know what the process is um, in terms of will the butters be notified? Do they have any role? That kind of thing. Because um, it's part of a whole as you know, plan of taking parking from one place, hoping to create parking in another, which we want to go through um, smoothly if we can. Um, so so it's about look, you want me to answer that? Um, so. Um, uh, notifying abutters for a map change um, in, in the zoning bylaw is not strictly required by state law, nor is it required by town um, law or regulations. However, we have had the practice of um, when there is a zoning change to a map, a specific area of a map, we do notify abutters within 300 feet of the property that's being rezoned because we think it's um, to their interest to know about this. But this is really kind of a courtesy on the part of the planning department to do this, but I think it is a good idea. Right, and there, there was concern that since it would be going from an RG to a BG that the town could decide to build apartment buildings or something else there. But I don't know if, if you have anything to say how the limitation, if that thing passes. If it goes from RG to BG, then whatever is allowed in the BG zoning district would be allowed on that property and there wouldn't be any limitations. Thank you. So other questions um, of Chris? Okay, um, Chris, uh, Dave mentioned in his introduction, mentioned uh, Belchertown Road and East Street School. Um, could you talk a little bit about what other efforts might be underway to, uh, to help produce either uh, so-called affordable housing, which the definition which escapes many of us, um, or workforce housing in, in the community? Well, we always have our um, feelers out for properties that might be appropriate for the town to acquire um, for affordable housing. I don't. I'm not aware of any. Um, immediately coming before us right now, but um, you know they kind of they kind of uh, pop up just like the Belcher Town Road project did. Um, we are making a very strong effort to um, have a new inclusionary zoning bylaw approved. We have the bylaw that's been uh, brought before the planning board and the CRC, and the planning board has made a recommendation to um, recommend to town council that it adopt this new inclusionary zoning bylaw. And what it means is that pretty much any project that has over 10 residential units would be required to have a certain percentage of affordable units. There are some exclusions like standard subdivisions and cluster subdivisions and institutional buildings and things like that. But for the most part, um, any multifamily uh, dwelling um, over 10 units would need to include um, affordable units. So we think that's a big, um, a big improvement in our prospects for providing mm -hmm. more affordable units. Okay, great. Um, we we uh, one of um, one of uh, of Paul's uh, goals, I think, is to make the town uh, uh, age friendly. 
and certainly the accessibility work will go to, to help that. The other question around the, and the unrelated question around that in terms of collaborating with other departments is in terms of parking standards and fees. Um, will the planning board be involved in looking at, uh, at our revision of parking standards? The planning board doesn't usually get involved in um, determining fees. Mm -hmm. for uh, parking, they, the planning board is more likely to get involved in um, design of parking spaces, um, requirements for parking spaces. There's a section of the zoning bylaw which spells out exactly how parking spaces need to be designed and what kind of surface they are put on and that type of mm -hmm. thing. But um, other than that, the plan and requiring parking spaces for projects. But other than that, the planning board doesn't get involved in you know, particularly municipal parking, which might be on uh, on a street that's in a public right of way that they don't have jurisdiction over. Okay. Yeah, I, I asked that because the American Planning Association just did a, started off a whole series on the, the billion dollar curbside, uh, looking at how parking is, is used and making some suggestions. I was wondering if that had worked its way out to, uh, to, to us. Um, well, the planning department um, will have uh, some influence on parking. Um, the planning department is working with Sean Mangano. Nate Malloy, who worked with the uh, Downtown Parking Working Group, is working with Sean Mangano, and I've been to a meeting about um, parking. So there's an effort to look at parking overall. So it's really not the planning board, it's the planning department that would be okay. helping in that regard. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, in the last. Uh, the, the last question is, is really uh, in terms of uh, professional advancement opportunities uh, for, for you and your staff in terms of training and uh, um, uh, in, in an overall skill acquisition. I just wondered how, you, uh, how you've been planning for that in this budget. We do have about $3,400 in the budget for professional development, and we make that available to people who want to go to uh, conferences or um, what, some of us used it to go to the MMA conference in early 2000. Um, so, uh, and, and recently um, members of our staff have used it to, uh, to train for and also to take um, a planning exam. The American Institute of uh, I think it's either certified or city planners. I'm sorry, I, I'm a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, so I'm not as mm -hmm. familiar with the planning. Um, uh -huh. But anyway, it's AICP test. And so they've used that professional development money to train for and take that test. And I'm hoping that they pass with flying colors. <laughs> but Super. we do use it to go to conferences. And, and during the past year, we've used it for webinars um, on, on the internet. Super, thank you. Any other questions of Chris? Because I have a couple. I'm just looking first to see if there's anyone else. I don't see any hands. I actually figured out on my screen how I can look at both. So I'm good at raised hands. So um, I have two, Chris. I saw among the other projects that you listed in the budget book was a thing that North Amherst knows about called the Eruptor, mm -hmm. which is potential new facility. And I think this is a joint question with you, of you and Chris, of Dave also. Um, they're in the process, as I understand it, of looking at whether the land and where they want to build and water issues are there. Do you get involved right at that very beginning before a project comes to say, what's the traffic going to look like? What's the entrance and exit for the building? So before it before it comes as a proposed project, what kinds of thinking as a planner and or conservation is put into, so you're not doing it after the fact. I, it's a question, I don't know how that works. So normally when a developer is considering developing a piece of land, they do come to us and they talk to us about what it is they're proposing to use, to do. They describe the use, they describe the size of the, Thing that they're proposing to build and roughly how many people would be working there and where they're expecting to get access. Um, so they describe these things to us. They don't give us any plans in advance, but they might show us a plan. Um, and we then consider and advise them about, um, yes, there's 
water up there. Maybe there's sewer up there. Um, where are you going to have your main access drive? You know, you have to be concerned about the wetlands, which, you know, we look at a GIS plan with them and say, there are probably wetlands here, but you need to get them flagged by, uh, you know, a competent wetland um, expert. Um, you know, so all of those things are things that we talk about with a potential developer. They often don't give us anything in advance because um, as soon as they give it to us, it becomes a public, <laughs> you know, public record. So, but they do talk to us about these things. Were there specific things that you were interested in? Uh, well, I'm not, not right now. I mean, we, um, we've actually they've been briefing the, some council members, particularly up here and local. So it is, it's sort of wrapped up with, you got the Pomeroy Grant lane intersection in part because you were talking about what might be coming. Mm -hmm. So this seems like if it really lo looks like it is coming, the one thing it's clear is there is, this intersection is a terrible intersection as it is. And mm -hmm. even trucks coming in and out to build this. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those are not necessarily the project, but are is a community impact mm -hmm. um, that can be anticipated. And to the extent, um, I've been really impressed. My, my other related question is, it seems like you've been bringing in a lot of grants, which is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, trying to think of here is an opportunity and um, pitching it in a very different way as uh, potentially disrupting what already exists. Mm -hmm. um, so it's both promoting economic development, but it also could really put a halt on some things if suddenly other things that are going on. So it's it's that kind of advanced planning that I was mm -hmm. questioning. Yeah, I, think, sure. I think you've answered that, but I think it there's that's a growing awareness even. Mm -hmm. um, there was a discussion the other day of turning off of 116 if you're going north is a sharp right-hand turn. Mm -hmm. a truck, we, the big trucks that would build something can't make that and that's a state road. Mm -hmm. So, and there's private land there, you know, making the turn. So it, it occurred to me, it's a, a large planning project. Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. not, mm -hmm. okay. Could, so, could I add a little? Yeah. Comment, Kathy? Yeah, so great series of questions. They're all all kind of linked and related. Um, and, and I think Chris covered, you know, um, the fact that we do, you know, whether you're starting a new restaurant or a hair salon or you're proposing to build a building or demolish a building or um, create any new business venture in town, we, one of the things we do, and I think we do quite well, um, is uh, we encourage and we support um creative uh, ventures in town and, and developers uh, and individuals and families to come in and talk with us. Uh, some years ago, you may recall, we, we um, advocated for and created the, the position of permit administrator within the conservation and development uh, suite uh, uh, functional area. And um, uh, Jennifer Mulland, who is that permit administrator, that is part of her role is when, when developer X or or individual Y wants to build a, a new house or a new building or bring in a new restaurant, the goal is to have that person get as much support early and often as possible. And this is long before a permit is a permit is applied for or an application is made to CONCOM or planning board or ZBA. So we do this routinely. We do multiple, you know, during the pandemic. I mean, this is it's actually Zoom has been very effective in helping us bring together teams. We do this with the colleges as well. When Amherst College is proposing something or Hampshire College is proposing something, they often come to us and we encourage them to come to us early and, and say, we're thinking of doing this. Could you give us some feedback? Um, and we try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and then to your question, kind of moving up to North Amherst, I think, yes, um, you know, we've been very successful over the last 14, 15 months in terms of um, uh, getting grant funding. We hope to, to continue that momentum as I mentioned in my opening remarks. Um, but yeah, now we believe now is the time to, to start looking again at North Amherst. Um, Chris and I, we never really, um, we never really left North Amherst. We simply, uh, we, we made some very, uh, uh, very organized and spirited uh, applications to the state, and we just couldn't get them to bite on the, the uh, intersection of 63 and Thunderland Road. 
but we will be back at that uh, very soon as we look at the um, at the eruptor project and anything else that might be proposed in the in the North Square. Um, the challenge always with with uh, the state is how do we meet their their criteria? How do we meet the the, the requirements of of the grant? And uh, particularly with MassWorks, one of the challenges there is that, um, in short. Um, the phrasing they use is it needs to unlock development. In other words, is something with our infrastructure holding back some development that the community wants? And uh, so we need to always put it through that lens of if we propose something to the state, at least through the Mass Works program, does it unlock development that we want? Housing development, mixed use development, et cetera. So I think that will be the lens again by which we look at North Amherst and, and the intersection, sure, at Sunderland Road in 63 and, and the Four Corners, but we'll also look at the surrounding intersections, like you mentioned at, at um, Meadow Street and Sunderland Road is an odd, odd intersection where Sunderland Road meets 116. So um, it's all part of that, that uh, looking at that comprehensively. So. Thank you. I don't want to take any more yeah. of, of people's times. Um, so I do want to thank you, Chris. I, I saw the meeting schedule up through FY20, and I can only imagine what FY this current fiscal year has looked like <laughs> with, with the number I alone have attended, and I'm not going to all of yours. So thank you and all your team very much. Um, thank you. So I, I think if there aren't any more for Chris, we move to the next on the list, which is inspections, correct? Yes, that was, you said that was the order. Um, and that I believe is Rob. If Rob, yes. do you want to say something for start, to yep. start us off? Yes, yes, hi, uh, Rob Mora, building commissioner. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about inspection services. Uh, we are a staff of 10 uh, full-time employees. Uh, we also have two part-time inspectors. That is our uh, plumbing and uh, gas and electrical inspectors. Uh, we also are responsible for weights and measures, uh, which is uh, contracted with the city of Northampton for those services. But uh, that's the program that'll look at uh, fuel pumps and scales for accuracy. Uh, throughout the town. Uh, included in our staff is uh, a position called the licensing coordinator. Uh, you, you're probably aware that a couple of years ago uh, when the Board of License Commissioners was created, uh, all the licensing was transferred from the manager's office to inspection services. So we, we now uh, you know, coordinate process inspection, uh, uh, licensing and uh, support the Board of License Commissioners both in their uh, license application review and uh, assist with uh, adoption of uh, new regulations or policies. Uh, and they've been a very active uh, group over the last couple of years uh, with new regulation and uh, looking even currently in future at uh, adopting uh, additional regulations and, and updating policies. A uh, couple of things that have happened recently that have, have been uh, really helpful for the department uh, include a new online permitting program. Uh, we've talked about this for, for many years. Uh, we, we had a program that was um, lacking in its uh, capabilities and uh, not able to create us the efficiency that we really need. And, and all that is changing. So we, we have launched the program uh, that uh, handles the rental permit, the residential rental permitting, and the licensing that I just spoke about a few minutes ago, including the health uh, department licensing. And that already uh, this year has, has made a, a big difference to the way the department functions. And we are uh, very close to launching uh, the, the part of the program that will allow uh, building electrical and plumbing permits to be uh, issued and reviewed through that, uh, that new program. So that's, that's great, not only for us, uh, for uh, efficiency and reporting and uh, holding permanently the record for those properties and projects, uh, but it'll be a great enhancement to the, the public with access to permits, uh, notifications of status of their, their, their project, 
uh, or application status and um, just the ability to make those applications online. Uh, to mention a couple things, you know, that are, are, are noteworthy from this past year, uh, you know, we were, we were very proud of our work with the uh, response to the pandemic having to do with expediting permitting, uh, uh, responding to applications under the Article 14, which is our temporary zoning for administrative approval, uh, which, by the way, is uh, getting, you know, the most action right now. So now we are, we are actively working on uh, several applications uh, so uh, it's a good sign seeing things uh, happening, either new or, uh, you know, improvements or alterations to existing establishments. Um, we are uh, also seeing, uh, finally, uh, some consistent numbers for our permitting. Uh, so April uh, does bring us back in line with prior years, excluding, of course, 2020 with both uh, number of permits and uh, value of construction. A uh, couple projects that are uh, of interest right now that are completing or, or uh, in process include Aspen Heights. That's the 88 union apart unit apartment building at the old Amherst Motel site. We are uh, weeks away from certificate of occupancy there. They are really down to the punch list items. Uh, that project has gone along nicely. And we are also working on a tenant fit up for uh, certain parts of the North Square uh, retail uh, portions of the building. Um, as mentioned earlier, we're, we're very much involved with the zoning bylaw amendment process. Uh, I, in particular, work pretty closely with Chris and her staff and attend many of those meetings uh, to help with that effort. So uh, that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Like questions? I know, Bernie, you had uh, worked up some if you wanted to start off. Sure. Um, uh, the question I had is is about um, the septic system permits. Do we have a, and I actually should know this, but uh, does the town have a required maintenance program for septic systems? Is that tracked? So I, I saw that question and we do not have a, uh, a maintenance program uh, necessarily. We, we of course have a health inspector that is responsible for uh, septic system upgrades, new new septic systems, and Title V inspection uh, monitoring, but there's no specific program for maintenance. Okay, uh, it's becoming you know it's, it's become an issue for me at least in terms of the costs we've incurred in in replacing septic systems with sewer lines, and uh, it would seem that an inspection program, an uh, ongoing pumping and maintenance program would be helpful, but um, that's my, my personal opinion. And the, other, uh, um, the other question I had, Rob, because I think you've, uh, you've touched on a little bit with the Board of Licensing Commissioner and getting them going. The other question I'd, I'd wanna ask you is, um, what uh, now that the uh, pandemic is, you know, that restrictions are being lifted and we're going back to a more, uh, uh, some, some semblance of normal, um, what are some of the surprises and challenges that you're you're expecting as we move back to whatever the new normal is? Uh, I think from uh, you know uh, uh, inspection services related to building, fire, electrical, plumbing inspections, uh, we're we're just uh, we're we're trying to be prepared to be open to. Uh, whatever uh, the need may be. So, you know, we had a mix of virtual inspections. We had, a, you know, some in-person inspections. So we handled it different ways over the past year. So we want to maintain that flexibility uh, as we expect people's comfort with allowing, you know, even us into their homes may, uh, you know, may be different uh, from, from place to place as we go. So we, we want to be prepared for that. Uh, the Board of License Commissioners, uh, I expect their work will continue. You know, there'll probably be more permanent uh, requests for outdoor dining and expansion of alcohol service. So we, you know, again, we expect to uh, continue our work to, to help people through that process as uh, efficiently as possible. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? I'm not seeing uh, Bob. And after Bob Lynn, let's see what order I show the hands go up. 
Yeah, I, I just have a question about uh, fines. Um, does does the does your department issue any fines, and what's the magnitude of the the the, the annual fines? I don't see it anywhere. It may be buried somewhere. Yeah, we we stopped reporting that in the in the uh, budget report. Um, we don't issue a lot of fines. Uh, we tend to work really hard, try to get compliance in other ways. Uh, it's always, you know, written into our enforcement orders and a last resort. Uh, we have over the years collected fines. They're usually fairly small amounts. If, if there's a fine assessed, it's, it's uh, you know, each individual fine is $100 or so. Uh, for uh, extreme cases, they add up because it's a daily fine. Uh, we will uh you know file for the collection of those fines in district court and appear in front of the magistrate uh in some cases we've agreed to reduce those fines or eliminate them entirely so we don't we don't put a lot of effort into collecting money that way but achieve compliance uh and i think we you know our record of the you know generally in a normal year three to four hundred complaint responses that are done uh, by the the code enforcement officer very few of those result in any uh, formal uh, action that includes a fine. Okay, thank you. Lynn? Yeah, my question is about permitting and um, when people uh, suspend or take a break from their permit and what is involved then when they decide to become active again. And adding to that, have we had many of those during this COVID period? Yes, um, we have had some during the COVID period. Uh, we have um, a little direction from the governor's uh, act that, uh, you know, basically tolls the, the, the period uh, that the permit was in effect for so that the expiration doesn't occur like it normally would under, you know, whatever the, the, the life of the particular permit is. So we weren't, uh, we weren't expiring permits, but there are other situations where work is abandoned and not uh, perhaps uh, closed down in a proper way. And you know, we will work on those and have worked on those uh, situations. Um, we've had situations where contractors have left the job and do not intend to complete the job or con continue with the, the owner or the developer of the property. Uh, so what happens in those situations is there's a, a basically a freeze on that permit until such time uh, everything gets back put in order. Uh, we have cases where some of the projects require structural analysis to confirm the condition of the materials that have been left exposed. Uh, we have situations where the contractor has to be, uh, their licensing and insurances have to be checked out and ensure that they're ready to take over the job or a job in Massachusetts. Uh, so there's a variety and, and, and we're, uh, I, I'd say there were uh, projects we knew about clearly that were very obvious. And then there's some that we will continue to learn about uh, as we come out of this and start to see the uh, construction activity pick up again. Lynn, did you have a follow up on that? Yeah, I do. So in other words, you do whatever you can within our rights to ensure that a pause in a building does not lead to an inferior build that could ultimately lead to, you know, a safety problem down the road. Um, you know, as, but that, that, I think that's accurate. Yes. And, and we, you know, we do have cases where uh, structural analysis has occurred by the, an independent engineer and uh, in fact, you know, I just gave notice to a developer just the other day that uh, that analysis that took place several months ago will need to take place again because there's been another three or four months of exposure to weather. Uh, so that, that, is, uh, that is priority before um, authorizing the construction to proceed uh, is to really stable, get we're, we're understanding where we are and start from a good place before that moves forward. So if a place, if a, a project is completely abandoned 
at some point, uh, is there any provision that whatever was done uh, is undone and the, and the uh, location is returned to its previous state or um, something like that? Uh, thankfully, that doesn't happen too often, but there are uh, ways to deal with that. Um, and, and I think we're, we're dealing with a completely unusual time. So the, the normal response may not be what we're looking at at the moment, uh, but a abandoned project, uh, unfortunately, we don't typically hold a bond or have any financial um, access to finances to, uh, to do what needs to be done for the project. Uh, life safety matters. Uh, there's a number of things, you know, a couple ways to go about that. I can approach the council, ask for funding under order of the building commissioner to go into the property and do certain work. And we would, in that case, ask for the court's support in that just to back it up before we were to do something like that. Or we would uh, order the owner of the property to do something, undo something, return it to its state, um, uh, uh, you know, make the determination that the project's been abandoned. And if we didn't get cooperation uh, to do that, then we would have to go into court and, and seek a court order to do that, to have that uh, completed. And as we incur expenses during all of that, are they charged back to the project or do we seek, we have to legal um, compensation? We have to uh, initiate collection of those uh, those fees, depending on what they are. If they're associated with an order that's been placed on the property, we would ask the court to uh, reimburse us those fees. Uh, that's pretty normal in an enforcement action. Say if we had, you know, service fees to the for the sheriff or mailing and administrative fees, we would uh, we would tally those up and ask the court to. Uh, provide that. And that's usually above and beyond if there's any fine by statute or regulation, uh, a daily fine. Uh, so it is, it is handled differently, but we would have to, we would have to seek the collection of those in, in some manner. So this may, my next question, which relates to all of this, um, may require Paul or someone else to chime in, but, you know, if a project needs a, um, a, an approval on a change to the right of way, then it actually comes to the council. And, you know, we've done some of those in the last uh, two and a half years. And uh, yet in one instance, particularly um, the right, nothing has happened at all on that project. Is there a point at which the right of way needs to be reviewed again? Uh, because the project has not gone forward. So uh, I'll and feel free to add to this, Paul, if you want. But uh, you know, one thing I point out is that when we do uh, permit, and it's fairly new, I think you know uh, we've the last couple of years projects have uh, included work in the public way or public areas in a uh, a, a more thought out uh, way under a design, which is great for the project and enhancement. Uh, but uh, we do need to be, um, you know, careful about how and when those spaces are accessed. And we have in the past couple of examples uh, accepted or required a bond for the value of that work. And, you know, in, in a situation like you're describing, it would probably be either Paul or the council to make the decision to say, uh, it's been long enough. I want to see the sidewalk put back together so that we're not walking around this construction site anymore. And, you know, we would start by demanding that the property owner do that, either a temporary or permanent solution, depending on what the situation is. And, or ultimately we would call the bond and uh, perform the work on our own. Thank you. And I, I also want to just add my thanks to the planning department to you, Rob, for everything you've been doing on all of the zoning bylaws and so forth. It's just been a tremendous amount of work and uh, something that the council really, truly pre appreciates. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for others with questions because I have a follow-up, I think, on Lynn's, but then I have a separate one. So before I jump in, 
Okay, I don't think I see anyone. So um, there is a specific building um, downtown where we granted up to January a right of way to block the sidewalk to be building. And clearly we're not in January anymore. And there's some reasons that building was delayed. Is that extension just, does that just automatically come from you, that was a specific by the council where there's a date uh, uh, that we put in. So it, are you authorized, Rob, to just say, well, there are reasons why it's still occupying that space? Um, um, I don't think I'm authorized to do that. Um, I, it, maybe it'd be Paul or maybe the council would take action on that. Uh, as far as uh, what the governor did, you know, that was really specific to any permit that was issued. So we've, we've uh, applied that rule of the tolling to all permits and uh, a- Uh-oh, I'm, I'm not hearing Rob. Did, did, it, did is that just me? No, no I'm, I'm not sorry. hearing him. I can't hear him either. Okay, uh, so I'll, st uh, yep, I'll, I'll start with that again. Uh, so we, um, we have, um, I, I would suggest that I would not have the uh, authority to extend that. And that would either have to come from the town manager or the council uh, to extend that agreement for the use of the, the, the public way. Uh, it, we have um, followed the governor's guidance on all permits that the town issues. And I don't think that's a permit. Uh, and the permits, again, they, they get told for this period. So they pick up at the end of the state of emergency on June 16th, where they were on March 10th so they don't lose the time uh, in between. Uh, certainly the council or Paul could just, you know, by their own policy decide that the same thing, you know, would happen uh, or something else. That would be a decision uh, by, by one of the two of those groups. Paul, it looked like you were gonna jump in. We're... No, okay. So this is something we can just, I can, we can ask about it later. It's, you know, it's a document. So the other one I had, I had, two um, that are in two different topics. One on rental inspections. We, we now do, uh, um, we don't regularly inspect. You go in if someone alerts you to a problem. I, I saw one town had done a um, differentiated kind of inspection process. They had labeled uh, properties as either quality of life nuisance that frequent phone calls coming in and or that in the past there had been some structural thing. And those places were on an annual inspection, not, not volunteer, but had to be until they had a five-year clean record. So I, I didn't, and they had an inspection fee that people had to pay. So it wasn't, so do you have any reaction any thinking of whether that is a good, bad, or you'd have to think about that idea a lot more before you did it. Because it, what it struck me, it also, a house, a place that was free, didn't get, you know, they had a five year, six year, they, they had much more of a sort of clean bill of health on yes. it. So yeah, yes, uh, I have thought about that. Um, we actually, do a small part of that informally now. So the, the, the regulations do not build in that part of the program. Uh, specific, you know, intentionally at the time when we were adopting the regulations, uh, inspection was supposed to be the next phase that we never uh, moved, you know, moved on to discuss. Uh, but what happens in, in the, you know, the course of the daily work is that we run across properties that need that kind of oversight. And we will use other uh, laws that we have to require periodic inspection and follow-up and usually set out a schedule from the beginning on how long that will last. It could be a year, two years, uh, or the, and lay out the frequency of inspection. Uh, in some cases, we will charge, uh, depending on which uh, regulation, if it's related to a health law, uh, the health codes allow us to charge a, an inspection fee uh, for each visit, and we will do that. Uh, and what we have done recently uh, over the last couple of months is started working with the Board of License Commissioners to uh, amend the rental regulations to include the ability for us to um, uh, uh, deem a property uh, one that needs this type of oversight, uh, whether it be a repeat offense or so many complaints within a period of time 
we're still working out the, the, the exact details of that and how far it will go. Uh, but we're trying to come up with something that will um, kind of work with the, the, the process we've established already uh, and be able to be handled by the staff that we have to, to see that through. Because uh, as you can imagine, when you get on these routine inspections on even a couple of properties, it's very time consuming for an inspector. Uh, so we, we want to really look out for the, co the properties at this moment that are in the most need. Yeah, and that my my sense in this other, I mean, if you I can send it to you, it was that they were trying to do the target that you're talking about, but then have the fee that was charged even pay for that because it was it was the safety of the tenants. It wasn't just you know the external conditions of the community. Um, so that's thank you. I'm glad you're thinking about that. And my my other, as I said, is totally in another direction. Do you do you with health inspections? if there's a uh, worried about a property has a brownfield and there's going to be construction on it, that there's, because of not necessarily even the current, but over the years, there's toxic substance in the soil. Does that come to you? Um, I got called by a resident who lives next to one and said, does the town even know about it? And so um, I, I know it's known because it came up in the historic commission as a demolition, but do we, does the town get involved in some way in moderating that? Is that EPA is, you know, where do we, where do we play in that kind of an issue? Yeah. Um, so I, I usually insert myself into almost anything. Uh, in, in, <laughs> uh, but, you know, in that particular case, and I know exactly the one you're talking about, because I had to make a decision on that one a few hours ago. And you know what was decided was that we would allow the the permit for the demolition of the building to occur, but not the concrete slab that the building sits on, until we uh, get a more clear uh, guidance from DEP, who would be the 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 kind of the state regulating authority there, and ensure that the owner of the property engages the proper soils engineer, uh, licensed soils professional to oversee that portion of the demolition. In this particular case, we feel like the structure is enough of a hazard that we should take it down. Uh, but it, and if we could do that without uh, disturbing the potentially the areas that are suspect to be contaminated, uh, and it, when we talked with DEP and got got some feedback there, uh, we feel like we can do that. So uh, we will condition a permit for something like you know that to occur in that way, and everyone would be just a little bit different. Uh, in some cases, we're not aware of it, or we come, become aware of it during the demolition uh, and would ask for, you know, something to happen. And typically, it'd be uh, the owner engaging the proper service or professional to uh, oversee and document what occurs there. And is there any, um, just since you probably, you do know the property, the concern is a plume and something being released to the air. And is there... Um, is there a way of telling abutters, the people who are right next door, um, that this is being seen to, you will be protected in you know, a, a public health uh, kind of measure? Yeah, so we don't have any notice ability. You know, we don't require notice or have any way to notice uh, property owners that it's going on. The, the uh, owner of the property has to notify us 48 hours before the demolition, but that's really where it ends. Uh, that notice in a case that we know is sensitive will have us go out to the site and make a visit where we normally may not have on a typical demolition. We would, we would likely wait for the project to end. And, you know, unless we heard something during it, we would go, go visit the site afterwards. But in this case, um, I would probably select, you know, Ed Smith, our health inspector, soils expert, uh, uh, training to be a sanitarian. We'd probably send him by to, uh, just have eyes on what's going on out there. And, and if there was need to, to ask for something more, we would. Okay, thank you. I, um, I don't wanna, and I see Dorothy's hand is up. That's very helpful. Dorothy. Yeah, this is a question, I guess, mostly for Chris. Uh, it's about timing. Um, I know that whatever plans are made for things when there's coordinated building and projects, they get delayed and certainly that's happened. So that we're kind of, our timing of a lot of things is off. So I got a call today from a former UMass grad who was thinking of moving into Amherst, wanted to talk about parking. 
And the question was, when the parking spots, when the work starts on North Common, which is in the future, I'm not quite sure how far in the future, what, at what state could a parking garage be? Or is it likely that there'll be a loss of um, a certain number of parking places and then it'll be a lo much longer time before the parking garage is um, operable? And you know, the thought is, would there be any short-term solution if there is a time gap between these two activities? Are there any short-term uh, solutions for uh, additional parking? Chris, yes, you're mute, you're you're muted, muted. Yeah. so Dave Zomick may be able to answer this question better than I, but um, I do know that the Department of Public Works is constantly sort of, you know, looking around town to find um, new parking spaces. And a few years ago, they did find um, a few on Spring Street, and they also built some on Spring Street. You may be familiar with that. So I think that's kind of an ongoing project that they have. Um, when the um, North Common project moves ahead, you know, that's going to be on one timeline. And then if a project moves ahead to build a parking garage, um, that's going to be on another timeline. So I really can't um, predict how those two timelines are going to intersect. But my, my guess is that um, the North Common parking is going to be probably, you know, um, is probably going to be uh, impacted prior to the parking garage. But um, we are bringing more parking in along the edges of the street, um, Main Street and uh, Boltwood Avenue. And as I said, um, the DPW is always looking around town to figure out how they can make some of the parking shorter so they can fit in more yes, yes, uh, yes. spaces. So, um, yeah. you know, that's an ongoing process. Right. Thank you. Perhaps I could just add, uh, Kathy, to Dorothy's question. Um, I think, you know, our target timeline for the North Common would be sometime in the spring of 22. So, and, and I think it's a little early to even speculate on, um, on the parking garage because of course, there's just been, been information brought to the council and it, it was referred to uh, the CRC. So we'll have to see how that all plays out and, and where that goes from there. Um, there's a lot of, lot of work to be done if, if we're headed in that direction, if that's something the council supports. But I think in general, Dorothy, your, your timeline, your, your broad timeline was accurate, which is the North Common project would get underway before there would be a gap between when the North Common project is completed and potentially if the town moves forward on a parking garage, when something like that would happen. But as Chris said, we're going to be looking constantly. I know we're working with Sean on, on improvements to parking in downtown. So I think you're going to see a lot of creative new options and, and just uh, more focused uh, work on parking in the next you know six to eight months. So I'm kind of optimistic about that piece of it. Kathy, can I add one thing to sure. what? Um, yeah, and one of the other things that was in the consultant's report that we've identified a couple targets that we might reach out to and, and we have more to kind of look through is to look at some of the private parking lots that are in downtown that we might be able to develop a partnership with to use those lots during certain, um, maybe on weekends or certain times of the day um, where you know, you'll see lots of so some of these lots just be completely vacant for certain parts of the day. Um, so we're, we're gonna be looking into some of those partnerships that might be available as well um, that could provide parking in the short term. Thank you. That's that's what we need. Um, anything else um, before we move? I think to conservation. Um, and I, you know, uh, Dave, you have a better sense of Chris and Rob's time on whether they, if we don't have direct. Oh, Bernie's hand is up. So if we don't have direct questions of them, you can also signal if they can leave. But Bernie, is your hand up on the topic we're already speaking about? Yeah. Yeah, just a real quick, uh, just a real quick thank you to Chris um, for all of the work that she does in her department. I really very much appreciate it. And I have some some notion of, of for both Chris and Rob of, of what they're up against. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I really want to express my admiration to Rob as well for the job that he's been doing in terms of, of inspections and wish him luck uh, getting whoever owns that, that demo project to 
um, do soil tests under the fat, under the slab. So uh, usually requires extra explanation when you have to do something like that. So thank you both. Yes, definitely. Thank you. So Great. Yeah. Kathy, you're all set. Yep. So I think Good. we're all set and we, we move to conservation, which was the next on the list, correct? Great. Yes. And mm -hmm. I, I will try to be brief. And yeah, it's kind of interesting just listening to all the uh, the the myriad of questions you have had for Rob and Chris. And it's kind of one of the things that makes my job so interesting is, is there's no two days alike. And, um, you know, I can't emphasize enough that really conservation and development, you know, including, of course, planning, inspection services, zoning, sustainability, that this is really, these are integrated departments. They appear in your book, you know, and they, they kind of stand alone in the budget book and the budget, budget presentation, but they really are integrated. We work so closely together on so many things and, and every project has elements of almost every discipline within conservation and development. So um, it's really, you know, and, and I echo the, uh, the sentiments to Rob, the work that Rob and Chris have done over the last year and, and many years because it's a pleasure kind of working with them and their staffs, staffs every day. So conservation, I'll be very brief, um, very, you know, it's a fairly small staff. We have two, two folks who work in the field, a land manager and assistant land manager. We have, of course, Stephanie Ciccarello, who I've asked to be on this call if there are specific questions uh, that come up related to sustainability. Stephanie is in the uh, attendees and we could easily bring her, her on for any of your specific questions there. Um, and then we have a wetlands administrator, Aaron Jock, who, who recently joined us. Um, in the field, you know, and, and I think to summarize, uh, you know, the last year, as I said in my opening remarks, um, it has not been a year of rest. It has not been a year of, of, uh, of kind of uh, just dealing with pandemic related issue issues. Uh, it's been a year of planning. It's been a year of going after grants. It's been a year of trying to move things forward despite the pandemic. Um, I would say uh, out in the field, um, there were more people using Amherst Conservation Land in 2020 than I've ever seen before in, in my lifetime. And I've lived most of my, my life in Amherst. It was extraordinary, the number of people out on the trails at Puffer's Pond, et cetera. Um, the work that Stephanie uh, was doing uh, and continues to do with the ECAC is really groundbreaking stuff. We want to be a, a leader, and and I think we're we're uh, we're we're moving in that direction uh, on so many fronts with sustainability. Um, and and again, I want to emphasize the integrated nature of Stephanie's uh, Stephanie's work. That uh, you know she is involved uh, with the conservation department, with the planning department, with the inspection services department. Uh, with facilities. You heard from Jeremiah LaPlante, I believe, last week on a number of projects, and Stephanie is right there in the mix. She's uh, also uh, in the conversations about new buildings in town from new school, library, and the, and the large capital projects. So it's she is everywhere we need her to be. Uh, on the wetland side, um, you know, we have a robust uh, wetlands program and wetlands protection program. I will say that 2020 was a year of people reinvesting in their properties. Um, we had more submittals, more notice of his, notices of intent. Um, we actually had a number of uh, a large number of enforcement orders as well. People were so busy at home that sometimes they got a little over over excited and and over involved in their properties and maybe uh, went a little too far on and expanding that deck or that garage. So. Aaron was right there out in the field uh, trying to coax them back into compliance with our local and state wetlands uh, uh, bylaw. In the field also, I, uh, earlier there was reference to some of the flashy storms we're getting. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our two field staff, um, uh, the amount of uh, management uh, concerns and management issues that they address in the field um, you know, in a given year now, we're seeing, pick a number, 125, 150 trees go down every year across trails. Uh, these flashy storms that come through the valley uh, all times of the year. Sometimes, you know, it used to be kind of a, a, a summer, a summer uh, occurrence, but now we get, a, we get a strange windstorm in January and 35 trees go down over trails. Those trees need to be cleared, their safety issues, uh, their accessibility issues, we need to move them. So 
all of those things happen within conservation in an integrated way with, uh, as well as with DPW. There's a lot of uh, collaboration that goes on with, with DPW. I think the themes moving forward uh, next year and, and in the years ahead, as people have heard me say that I think we're moving, we're moving gradually toward a management approach in, in the conservation department. Um, for many years, we, we did acquire a number of different properties. I think the only acquisition that is still pending right now is Hickory Ridge, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. It's not to say that we, we won't, the Conservation Commission and, and uh, residents may, may, uh, may not put, bring forth another acquisition in the years ahead, but I think I've really tried to emphasize priorities. What are the priorities for acquisition? Um, we're, 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 we use very specific criteria. What, what are the reasons for acquiring new conservation land? We want to make sure that we can take care of what we have and balance um, development in village centers, as well as uh, connecting our, our open spaces and our agricultural lands. Um, so other themes uh, that, that are, are talked about in the budget uh, presentation are access. We want to do additional work on our ADA trails, making our trails more accessible for those people with disabilities. We want to improve access with regard to parking and making sure that people have adequate places to, to park when they come to a, a conservation area. When, um, when uh, the pandemic hit, we were seeing kind of uh, access areas along various trailheads just kind of busting at the seams with, uh, with people wanting to use them. And I think we have some interesting um, and exciting projects planned for, for the coming year. In particular of note, um, we'll be redoing the parking area at Stanley Street, the access, one of the access ways to uh, Wentworth Farm Conservation Area. And then we'll be adding some parking down on Bay Road, uh, access to the Mount Holyoke Range, the 5,000 acres of the Mount Holyoke Range is a major um, need out there, identified working with the state and, and with our partners at the Kestrel Trust. So we'll be uh, doing a, a, a new parking area, perhaps even two off of Bay Road to allow more access to the uh, easier access to the Mount Holyoke Range. Um, let me see, I know that Bernie and others submitted a few questions. My apologies, I did not get these, these responses to you in writing in advance of the meeting, but I'd be happy to talk about those um, if, if the time is right, Kathy. Um, so why don't we start with Bernie? It was mainly mainly Bernie, and Bernie, maybe start with whatever your top priority is, because you had a pretty long list. Okay, well, I, that list can get shorter because I think Dave's spoken to some of those already. Uh, I did want to mention that um, the Trust for Public Land, as I said in the questions, the Trust for Public Land gives us a 65% park score uh, to Amherst, which means... Um, 65% of our residents are with a 10 minute walk to a park or conservation area. Um, and the data that, uh, that uh, TPL's compiled shows that that access is very equal in terms of age, uh, income. Um, it, it's really, uh, really an, a nice score. Um, I should also mention that our, our good friends in Northampton got a 48 and the <laughs> national average is 55. So we're where we can give ourselves some, give Dave and his crew uh, some points on that. Um, I asked about a green print, but Dave, I think you've already addressed that. You say you're really not looking at that much at further acquisition. But you're really moving towards managing what we have now. So I, I think, um, if, Bernie, I think to that point, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, if if we do find a property, you know, a year <laughs> from now, three years from now, that somebody doesn't say, well, back in 2021, you said you weren't going to, you know, go for any other acquisition. Mm -hmm. And and I think it is possible that we will. There's still a few hundred acres, I'm going to say, probably 400 acres of unprotected, four to 500 acres of unprotected farmland remaining in the town of Amherst. And it's priority farmland and it's um, uh, prime soils. Um, and, and these are even lands that are not part of uh, college campuses. So mm -hmm. there's land that uh, should should in all likelihood be, be preserved. What I'd like to do is look creatively at some things like limited development. Um, there are some properties that we've identified that would be excellent candidates for um, limited development, i.e. working closely with the housing trust, we could acquire property X and um, 
uh, both conserve the the land that is ecologically sensitive, say in the back along the along a river corridor or along a wetland corridor, and then uh, add uh, affordable housing on the frontage. And we've got a, a short list of those, probably five to seven properties where that would be appropriate. And I've had good conversations with John Hornick about these possibilities. So we're always trying to cultivate those those uh, those relationships with those owners who haven't quite decided what they want to do with their land. With regard to the TPL uh, green print, I think it's something we need to, to actually look um, a little harder at, Bernie, because we do have, you know, that score of 65 is, is certainly higher than average. You know, uh, and I give a lot of credit to uh, Pete Westover, who are, was our conservation director for 30 years. And really, mm -hmm. Pete was the architect of the, for instance, the trail system and the network of conservation land that we have. And it's no accident that these trails connect uh, village centers to schools, to, to uh, farmland, and the list goes on and on. Um, it, when you look at it with different layers of the GIS, you will see that, you know, Crocker Farm connects to, you know, can connect to East Hadley Road, which connects to um, uh, uh, Groff Park, and the list goes on. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to make those connections solid. Uh, and improve them. A great example, I think, was you know uh, when planning staff and I got together with DPW input and said, how can we provide better access to Groff Park and green space for those residents of town living off of East Hadley Road in the neighborhoods there? And so what did we say? We said, well, one thing would be to have safer, wider sidewalks on East Hadley Road better crossings at Route 116, an improved destination. So we pulled together the CPA funds and the state funds and did the wonderful Spray Park new playground at, at Groff Park. We now have additional funds in uh, other grant monies going toward uh, improvements to the sidewalk along Mill Lane. We already completed the work along East Abbey Road. And to complement that, we are moving forward with the acquisition of um, Hickory Ridge Golf Course. So all of that, I mean, right there, our, our TPL score might go up to an 80. When I hear a 65, I think, boy, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not doing that well. We, I'd, I'd rather be up in the 85 range. So uh, just, are... <laughs> the, the, other, the other town we get compared to all the time, Cambridge is a 98. So uh, there is some, there is some, some room to stretch. And, uh, yeah. so on anyway. a personal note, thank you for all the work along East Hadley Road. My grandkids really appreciate it. So those um, are the kinds of things we're doing all the time, and I think to, we'll speak to that green yeah. print that TPL uses. That's true. Um, I had a question about you, you mentioned trail maintenance. I had a question. This actually uh, this actually came up on the other committee I'm on, which is the Transportation Advisory Committee, about the mapping of those trails and how adequate is that mapping, how accurate is it, uh, in the descriptions of the trails, uh, the trail use. Uh, so if you could just speak to that for a little bit, we'll let the, the other questions go. Yeah, it's a great question, Bernie, and I can, I can, I can wrap a couple of things into it. Um, we're not satisfied with the current uh, mapping that we have. Um, uh, that's the short answer. We want to improve the mapping. The map that we currently use, they're, they're, they're accurate, um, but they're not as functional as we would like them to be in, in this uh, time period we're living in. So uh, we've had some really fruitful discussions with Mike Warner and Aaron Jock, who is, is the newest member of the conservation team. Uh, Aaron is our wetlands administrator, but also has a master's degree in GIS. So she and Mike talk the same talk, walk the same walk. So we're planning some pretty major revisions to our trail system maps in the next year. And you'll see those coming online, I would imagine in the spring of 22. We're also looking at revising our uh, sign system. Um, the conservation sign system is a wonderful kind of throwback to the 1970s, but it really doesn't brand our conservation areas well. Um, there's been brand confusion out there, kind of who owns what. Um, and there's a lot of confusion among people that uh, they don't understand what are the rules and regulations? What can they do when they're out on the conservation land? And we want to really bring that all into uh, consistent spaces, both on the land at kiosks, but also using our online um, tools to communicate that to the public. So that you'll see a lot of changes coming, I think, out there 
in the next year, year and a half on both those fronts, signs, and then also new maps. Um, so I'll stop there. Super, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, is your hand up? Yeah. Um, so that ties beautifully into my question. Um, you're right, I, I never walked on any of the trails until this year, and this was the first time I did it. But um, I'm a very novice person. So I have a friend, Barbara Pearson, who seems to know all the trails, and sometimes she takes us on walks. And on my own, I would never be able to do it because it feels, you can't tell what's private property, what's where you're allowed to be sometimes when you're not allowed to be. Um, but there are all kinds of strange and interesting shortcuts um, that I would not have imagined. And I'm just wondering, if uh, you could do this perhaps as youth employment, um, more organized advertised trail walks, you know, at set times where you would uh, be somebody guided trail walks um, and you could hire, hire and train young people to do it. So that's my idea. Is that at all possible? It is, I see Paul smiling. I think I know where he's going, but um, <laughs> there's not enough of me to go around or my staff. Um, Let me just jump in there. So. <laughs> I, I've for since I started here, I've asked David to start a company called Z Tours, where he would he, Zomac Tours because he knows so much about so many things, and he would be he's wonderful to take a tour with. So, yeah, Paul wants me to lead the historic tours of old mill sites, and yeah, you know, I would uh, love it. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's something I I think, you know, I think it's something we would need to partner with. To be honest, Dorothy, to partner mm -hmm. with the high school, to partner with. It's a, it's a good thing to partner maybe with the Hitchcock Center or the Kestrel Trust because we are really, we're not set up uh, uh, staff, staffing wise and resource wise to have those kinds of, of hours. We really, to manage and maintain over 2000 acres of land. Uh, if we think about wherever we live, you know whether you have a little plot of land that you plant vegetables in or, or you have an acre or you have whatever, um, it, 2000 plus acres is a lot to manage and we get all sorts of requests. So I think it would need to be in partnership with, with the educator, the, the, the organizations that do education in our, our area. Hitchcock is a great example and they're actually doing it. They are, um, they just were before the conservation commission and they are doing outreach um, to their walk. They're offering free, free conservation walks uh, near village center excuse me, Village Park, I'm sorry, I have village centers on the brain, Village Park Apartments and one other apartment complex in Amherst. And they're gonna be using a new QR codes out on the trails. So that links to the background education information uh, to whatever you're seeing out there, birds, animals, mammals, and et cetera, so. Okay. Thank you. You, you wanna work with the high school cross country teams. They know, they run all over mm. the place. <laughs> yes. Nice. And lastly, if I could just say Hickory Ridge uh, acquisition is, it, it was asked by a couple of uh, counselors. Uh, we are we are on point. Uh, our goal is to close this this uh, summer. Uh, we, we have a, a date in August to close. I know that has moved a couple of times, no real fault of the town. We are prepared and preparing, continuing to prepare to close. It really is all linked to the solar program in Massachusetts, the solar tax credit program in particular. Uh, for for the company that is going to build the solar out on Hickory Ridge. So that is something that is kind of separate, parallel, but related to our closing. So we are, we are uh, working with our town attorney and we are ready to close. We are simply waiting for the state to make ready uh, the, the, all of the, um, uh, the financials related to this company doing um, 26 acres of solar out on the uh, out on the golf course. Our goal would be to be an off taker uh, for some of that um, solar, so that we could uh, expand our green uh, our green uh, purchasing of power, and also reduce our costs by a, a percentage by um, by going green with uh, with our power. So, I, I would look for something in August, early September, in terms of a closing. Um, I see Bob's hand. Bob, is your hand up? Yeah. 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 Could you uh, give us an update on the uh, solar array on, on the North landfill, please? Sure. Uh, in, in brief, um, that is a project that Stephanie has been working extremely hard on for a number of years. Um, 
We are putting the final touches. The company has been out doing all their final uh, preparation work. Uh, they recently mowed that this is the North landfill. So the project will be solar on the North landfill. Um, for those listening, that is the landfill uh, where the transfer station is. Uh, in parallel to that will be, uh, we are being required by the state to put a conservation restriction on the South landfill or the larger, newer, younger landfill uh, off of old, old Belchertown Road. Um, and our, our, our timeline right now is to break ground again later this summer. Um, I think um, uh, an August, early September groundbreaking there is, is quite possible. Um, so we're, we're kind of dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the, the final legal documents. And I think we'll see uh, shovels in the ground uh, late summer, early fall. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. I'm looking to see if I, I have a couple um, questions. I'll start with Hickory Ridge. Um, the Dave, if, if it is moving and does move at some point, what the, the larger discussion had been what to do with the six to seven developable acres that are there that wouldn't be kept as open space and surveying of it. Do you have a timeline in mind or say date finally approved and happens to within six months of that, we will have done the following. So that's a question of a framework because I'm actually, I've gotten some questions on DPW fire station. Why not fire station on that piece of land? And I'm sure Lynn will jump in and tell me why, but it's, you know, people are thinking of there is that piece of land um, and what might it be? And so the number of discussions where people start to have it a year and a half ago. So just some, time estimate. And then I have one other question that's not related. Yeah, let me quickly address some um, other capital projects. So um, the short answer is that neither one of the other buildings would, would be an appropriate use of that space. Um, DPW, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is there's not nearly uh, enough buildable land off of Pomeroy Lane for a DPW to, uh, to site there. It is also one of the most ecologically sensitive uh, yep. areas in the town of Amherst. And one of the only reasons we're able to acquire it is because of all the restrictions that will come on the rest of the land. Just to give people an idea, the solar company will be developing uh, 26 acres of solar and they are required to um, mitigate almost acre for acre. So they have to restore almost one for one every acre that they put in solar they have to restore to uh, a more natural state than a golf course about 20 acres of adjacent land. Um, that means replanting. That means basically turning the clock back to pre-agricultural um, pre, uh, days. Um, so it's a very limited site uh, and many restrictions, but there are some buildable acres on the, on the frontage where the current clubhouse is. In terms of um, fire, um, we did look at that site and ha we had conversations with Paul and Chief Nelson and others and, and um, uh, I think uh, Lynn and, and those members of the, the committee that studied fire uh, throughout the town uh, would agree that the, the site is far too far, too far south and too far west uh, in terms of response times to be appropriate for a fire station. We looked at it. Um, but clearly the current DPW site is far and away a much superior site in terms of response times south, but also response times to get back into town in the case of a, a major fire in town. So yeah, those, I didn't, those, I didn't yeah. actually, sorry, I didn't mean that you had to, I'm just sure, saying that, just, that people are speculating about yeah. the, this, you know. Yeah. On, yeah. I wanted people to know we looked at, uh, we looked at the site for both. And then in terms of timeline, I mean, it's been a major, um, a major initiative to get to closing. So we're going to get to closing. We need to take a little breather here. Um, and I know that everybody hasn't been um, a part of all the, the work up to get to this point. But I think once we own it, we need to take a step back, take a, take a, a deep breath and say, let's pull together um, a process, a master planning process for the site. Um, and we will utilize all the tools available to us, uh, like Engage Amherst, 
Um, and we will do all of the outreach to the communities around uh, in Orchard Valley off of East Hadley Road and others, uh, other constituent groups who want to be part of a master planning process. And I think we're going to take eight months, eight to nine months to do a master planning process for the land. We're going to need to look at the ecological attributes of the land, the developable acreage of the land. Um, I have been bombarded with people interested in everything from disc golf to dog parks to community gardens to um, to uh, cell phone towers to oh the list goes on. I must have had twenty to thirty inquiries. Um, somebody inquired about putting a putting a um, a practice uh, course there for uh, mountain biking. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I think we need to bring together all of those parties in a master planning process. The university has reached out as has the Conway School of Design and they would love to help us uh, by bringing students, volunteers to help us with that process. And again, it'll be an interdisciplinary process that uh, the planning department and the conservation department and other departments in town will all be a part of. Okay, thank you. Um, I we're don't. Not, we're not going to rush to this is what this should be. We need to take some time to to really involve as many people as possible. So thank you. I don't. Um, I'm seeing that Emma has joined us, and we do have public health on. So I'm. I see Dorothy's hand is up, and I'm. My other question was about volunteers, but I can talk to you. I just, a sense of the volunteer squad that you have, Dave, um, at some point it would be good for us to hear it because even on trail walks, I think you already have a lot of trail management that's volunteer. It's not just your team, which is, which we, I think is great. I think more is better actually. My, yeah, we we yeah. don't have as much as you'd think. Okay, because I, yeah. I think there's an opportunity for more, I guess mm -hmm. would be my comment. I agree with you. So, I wonder if we can get moving along yeah. uh, and hold questions like that out because they're not directly yeah. financial so we can get to reparations. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm taking that off the list. And Dorothy, if you can wait, because we still have uh, the public health before we get to reparations. Can yours wait? Uh, will Dave Zomick still be here? No. So go ahead. Very quickly. Um, you've ruled out some different things for the uh, piece of land. Um, that's uh, buildable on Hickory Ridge. Is there anything that rules out housing? Actually, you might have misunderstood, Dorothy. I haven't ruled out anything, really. Oh, I think fire I and DPW. Oh, know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, we we assess the land for those. I'm sorry. Yes, you are correct. And we looked at what what was needed for both of those facilities, and that piece of property does not fit either one of those. But beyond that, we really haven't ruled out anything. And okay. housing is certainly. Affordable housing, mixed use housing is certainly in the in the mix. Good. Thank you. So are we ready to move to Emma Dragon? And then that is that will finish this piece and then we can go over to reparations. Is that okay with everyone? It looks like yes. So Emma, you're on. Welcome. Well. Thank you. So this is my first time presenting here for the finance committee. So um, I do remember I spoke to Sean in, in preparation for this, just because a little bit of like new person worry. And um, I'm, I'm not going to restate what's written in the report um, and really try to focus on, on caveats of great things that we've done in the department. So um, in terms of an organizational structure for permanent staff, it is uh, myself as a one FTE and Jen Brown. Um, throughout the time of COVID, we have expanded our staff under COVID uh, care funds. Um, we currently have two and uh, 2.5 FTEs of administrative support. We have four homebound per diem nurses, as well as our um, remote contact tracing support Arlene Reed, which is another nurse. Um, we've also, earlier in the pandemic, we were engaging the school department nurses that were willing to assist us with contact tracing. And they also assisted us with, clinic, with clinics, which was really wonderful to see. Um, so we've really grown into this temporary robust staff to make all the programs 
viable that we've been doing. Um, in terms of uh, things that we've done, we have done the clinics, we have done um, mobile vaccinations, we have done the clinics at the school systems, just incredible work. Uh, I know I've been in communications with um, trying to expand our vaccines to work with equity issues, vulnerable populations to meet those where they're at, like mobile market or their survival center. Um, and really our, our drive with that continues to grow as Amherst has a, a large, the, the highest percentage of an environmental justice population in all of Hampshire County, and certainly the many social determinants of health um, with those that are um, the 35.7 that live below the poverty level here in Amherst and also that have English as not their primary language. For, in terms of resources, I think um, not having uh, continual permanent health staff is challenging to make programming successful uh, with our long range objectives. Um, we certainly understand the, the current climate of finances in the town um, and are continuing to try and access uh, grant funding and other avenues um, to make uh, priorities possible. Um, one thing that we were able to accomplish, or actually two things so far, uh, are, is the Board of Health uh, adopted and approved um, Tapestries Harm Reduction Program to run a mobile program here in Amherst. Um, we are also, I know, uh, Lynn, I can look at you with the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District and the opt-out. Those are the, pretty the two recent big things I can think of, but what an energizing time of work to be here in the health department. It feels like we've done years of work in the six months that I've been here <laughs> since November. Um, it's just really been a whirlwind. So I'm not sure what else I should be adding, Sean and Paul. I think, I think, I think that's good. Um, and you addressed, I think, the, some of the questions already a little bit, um, but we did get a few questions from um, Mr. Steinberg yeah. about the department. If you want us to go through those, Kathy. So Andy, would you, do you wanna raise the questions that you sent in, I think this morning? So. Um, I can let Sean do it because he has the questions and he might have the answers to go with them. Yeah, so the first question was, um, how have any of the cannabis community impact fees been used uh, for um, some education on marijuana and vaping? And so the response to that is we haven't used any impact fees yet from marijuana. That, that is one of the anticipated uses will be education um, when those funds are uh, allocated out, but we haven't used any of the impact fees yet. The second question, this one is more for um, Emma, and that is, um, there is also mention of the town veterinarian. Is there a budget associated with that position? Yes, so um, we do, I, I'm not sure if Dr. Katz is contracted or what the employment status is, but that's a long-term um, established past practice relationship the town has had with Dr. Katz um, to assist and, and aid with processing um, samples that from animal control that would have to be shipped to Boston for uh, rabies testing um, in a sterile way. So that line item has been part of the budget for some time here in the health department. And Emma isn't joking, really. The name is Dr. Katz for our, for our vet. So <laughs> I thought she was fooling me the first time. So. Um, you, you, you have not been in Amherst long enough to understand <laughs> Mike, no. Mike is a, he, he's part of Amherst. <laughs> um, and then the third question was, how have we used CARES and FEMA funds to support public health work in the current fiscal year um, and plans for the American Recovery Act? So we've used, uh, uh, Emma talked about some of the additional support staffing that have already been hired for um, just administrative functions and also for contact tracing. Um, we also, the ambassador program, we view that as sort of an extension of the health department in, in terms of enforcing the protocols throughout town. Um, I'm sure there are other smaller things, but those are the, the big ones that come to mind. 
and then plans for the American Rescue Plan. Um, we're still sort of, so we've worked on a process for how those funds will be uh, potentially allocated. And, and, and so nothing's really been decided for how those funds will be used. Um, but I could envision some of those funds being used for Board of Health, Public Health type things going forward. That's one of the eligible uses um, is that anything that was eligible for CARES theoretically could be eligible for um, these funds as well. Are there other questions of Emma? Uh, Pat. I don't have a question, so I'm breaking what I just asked for a moment ago, but I just have such grateful, I'm really grateful for the work that you uh, have done in this town in the short time you've been here. You're an impressive, powerful, and thoughtful woman, and we're very lucky to have you. So thanks. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Lynn. Actually, Emma shared something with me in a meeting earlier today that I would like it to be more known, and that is the percentage for Amherst for vaccination is not great. And so we all have a lot of work to do. And I want us to figure out how we can support Emma and others in getting that vaccination rate up higher. We are not even at 50% for first shots. Can, can I just build on that? You know, a couple of people I know volunteer, they're retired physicians who are with you um, giving shots. And they said people still are not aware that it really is walk-in appointments and it really is free. They found people saying, are you sure? And is there a way, she was wondering of having it appear in the Amherst Bulletin regularly and, and having, you know, even when we get emergency storm warnings on our phone where we just get robo called to say alert, because she felt, Lynn, that people didn't know, you know, that she's, she says, oh, we're all, you can come, you know, um, when she was encountering people and she's been drumming, trying to, drum, this is a she, it's been trying to drum up business. So, so I didn't know, and it's not an answerable now, but she, she felt that that word wasn't broadly out, that there's not cues, there aren't lines, you know, you, you can get vaccinated, so. That's a great suggestion. I'll, I'll bring it back, yep. Dorothy. I was listening on the news today to programs around the country, which are using uh, lotteries and uh, scholarships. And um, we certainly should look into that. Um, I just think we should, we have to use every way possible because I want everybody vaccinated. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want them, you know, causing havoc. So if there's some kind of way we can do it, you know, maybe Emma can come up with it. How about a pass for the pool for the summer? Right. So, so I, I think, I, I'm ignore my phone. So Emma, I think everyone is giving you a big thanks for um, mobilizing forces. And the people I know said the, these clinics have been amazing. They really work well. So they're well organized. Thank you very much. Yeah, our, our over 150, we've had over 150 volunteers since um, everything started since January 11th, our first, first responder clinic. Um, just really tremendous, amazing group of people that have come together and made it possible without um, all of them and, and us. Uh, I, I don't think that a, a robust vaccine program would have come here in Amherst. And I'm just really proud of the work that we've all done together. So, so thank you. And I think this is a transition of chairness to Andy as we move to the next part of the program as if it was a program announcement. Is that correct, Andy? Yes. Thank okay. you, Kathy. Right. That was really, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Emma, for all who have been here uh, to meet with us. Uh, uh, Kathy, so do I go now? Lot. It's the reparations yeah. time, right? Yes, no. it is. But all thank, right. thank, we didn't want you to feel like you weren't. We, we totally no. appreciated your time. Thank you. Absolutely. I get it. Thank you for your time. Have a good afternoon. So uh, we are in a transition point and I, we do need to keep an eye on the time because we said we were going to limit this meeting uh, so we can get on to the next. Uh, Michelle Miller 
is now with us. Um, I think uh, Athena is also going to bring in Matthew Andrews and Herb Rhodes um, because the three of them <laughs> have been involved in the reparations discussion. And to set this up, I want to go back to the motion that was made in the council meeting on May 17th that is the um, reason that um, we are um, having this agenda item today. The motion was Brewer moved, seconded by DeAngelis to refer, let's see, um, I'm gonna try and cut to the mic. And uh, for recommendation of the town council on a revenue stream for reparations fund in the FY22 budget. So the key part is the, that last piece that I read, which is um, it's being referred to us for a recommendation to the town council on a revenue stream for a reparation fund in the FY22 budget. So I wanna start the discussion by asking the town manager if he has any introductory comments that he would like to, to make on the subject. Um, thank you, Andy. I actually don't. Um, I think the reparations for Amherst group has really put together a pretty um, strong proposal that they um, have presented to you. And this is your opportunity to ask some questions. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess I'm gonna then go to Michelle and Matthew who are the uh, uh, two who are the um, presenters through most of the council meetings uh, and uh, Irv really uh, uh, has been involved, I understand, but I had not had any communication with him about it for a while. Um, Actually, uh, just double check, Lynn, did you have anything you wanted to say at the beginning since uh, your hand was up? Um, no, I'm sorry. I mis misinterpreted okay. the question. Okay, so let me turn it over to uh, ask Michelle and Matthew if they have any introductory presentation that they would like to make. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. And I hope this is an enjoyable part of the program as you called it. Um, and excuse me for having to read from a statement. Um, I get a little nervous, so this is helpful for me. It's not very long. Um, so this week, a joint meeting was held between the Amherst African Heritage Residents for Reparations, which includes Dr. Barbara Love, Kathleen Anderson, Hallow Lord, Irv Rhodes, Dr. Amilcar Shabazz, and Ben Harrington, all current or former elected officials and reparations for Amherst. It was unanimously agreed upon to suggest to this committee that it recommend allocating 100% of the FY22 cannabis revenue to a reparations fund. The budgeted amount is 190,000, though it is our understanding this could be a conservative estimate. Future year fiscal recommendations will be part of the work of the newly formed reparations committee. There are poetic and practical reasons to do this. Since the 1970s, enforcement of marijuana possession laws has been carried out with staggering racial bias. According to a 2013 report published by the American Civil Liberties Union, nearly half of all drug arrests made in 2010 were for marijuana possession. And although marijuana use was roughly the same among blacks and whites, blacks were nearly four times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession. See marijuana and racism bearing the blunt of the problem, which I can share in an email to this group. Practically speaking, the Cannabis Control Commission in its guidance on equitable cannabis policies for municipalities recommends the same. This is a quote from their guidance document. A municipality may adopt a tax of up to 3% on adult use cannabis retail sales by a vote of its legislative body. In many state and local jurisdictions, Massachusetts included, a portion of cannabis tax revenue is earmarked for restorative justice, jail diversion, workforce development, industry specific technical assistance, and mentoring services equity goals, 
may similarly be supported by designating part of the local tax or community impact fee if adopted as part of the host community agreement for similar local programs. This is likely why other communities like Evanston and Portland have directed their cannabis revenue toward reparative justice initiatives. And Matthew's gonna uh, follow up now. Yeah, thanks Michelle. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for inviting us here. Um, I just wanna acknowledge that while we do recommend cannabis as, uh, you know, for looking at revenue streams, it's not the only revenue stream that's possible. And you all, the finance committee in particular, are the experts on the budget um, and would have a better understanding of what will work best in Amherst. Um, we've seen other municipalities use cannabis for reparations, but uh, Amherst is a unique place with a unique situation, unique fiscal situation. And um, you all would know best how to, to create a reparations fund, or at least what we're really talking about is making a visible substantive commitment to reparations right now, you know, when we're looking at the fiscal year 22 budget. And of course, this is a complicated situation because, uh, you know, the town council has asked the finance committee to come up with a revenue stream when the budget is essentially baked. And so we understand that that's not a simple matter. There's no easy money just laying around. Um, and so it comes down to a question of, of will and whether the, you know, the, the moment, this kind of historic collective awakening of compassion that's going on around the country and that's going on here as well, um, whether there's a, enough will to, to make a statement right now and to put money behind it. And I'll just add that there's been a lot of complicated situations arising recently in relation to um, BIPOC, the BIPOC community, if we can call it that, and some, you know, um, and a lack of trust with the town. And there's a lot of racial equity issues and initiatives that the town is working on that are valuable and important. But if we don't start with reparations, if we don't first show and demonstrate that this town is committed to a reparative process, then those other initiatives become much more complicated because we haven't done the atonement, acknowledgement, and commitment to repair that needs to come before we can hash out all the, the, the details. And of course, even right now, we're not talking about solving reparations with a fiscal year 22 allocation. We're talking about a substantive, significant commitment that's a starting point for the reparative process. And so we're grateful to be here and to collaborate with you all on that effort. Um, and I think Irv, did you wanna uh, share something as well? Yeah, for, you know, we can hear you. Um, I guess first, I, uh, I wanna make sure I'm standing on this, the, the right ground here. Uh, so Andy, uh, I would like for you to, um, um, to reiterate the charge that the council gave to you in terms of this matter. Okay, that's gonna take just a moment to get back to that page, but fortunately I also have the train running outside my window at the moment. Uh, the motion again, the part of the motion was, it was it, um, request that the finance committee make a recommendation to the town council on a revenue stream for a reparations fund in the FY22 budget. All right, is, uh, Lynn, is that your, your understanding? Yes. All right, because uh, I, I had thought that they had said possible. Uh, was in there. But we did. Have, in there, Herb, you are correct. We did say possible. That got added in, but uh, it got added in at, right before we passed the motion. Right. And, and the, reason, the reason that's important because if we go uh, down this road and in, in, in terms of the recommendation, 
um, then I want to be clear. Uh, I wanted to be clear what we were talking about. So given that, right, the African uh, Heritage Coalition, which includes the um, former and present uh, elected representatives, uh, and uh, will uh, will expand uh, once uh, this goes forward uh, uh, in the council. You know, uh, we are, uh, as of right now, we're an informal group. We have been working with um, reparations for Amherst as this thing moves forward. We, like everyone else, thinks of in terms of what reparation and restorative actions will consist of. And those things will be developed in, in the very near future. However, to anchor all of that is the revenue, the revenue to support those decisions. Uh, and, and so we have uh, zeroed in on one, of many uh, possibilities. And that's the cannabis um, uh, 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 revenue stream. That we would like to go forward with um, as soon as possible for this year, this upcoming, upcoming fiscal year 22. Uh, and that's what we, uh, we will be focusing up on um, really, really um, in an intense manner. Again, this is only one possible one. There are other possibilities, but this would be a meaningful beginning uh, to go forward with and to communicate uh, back uh, to um, our communities that which uh, Matthew just ma mentioned, that there is a willingness uh, to go forward with a restorative uh, and rep uh, reparations uh, for Amherst. And so I, I believe that it would uh, behoove the council to move with this uh, with all deliberate speed. Thank you. Well, thank you. So I'm gonna to turn to Sean in a second uh, because uh, the budget uh, as was indicated is something that is uh, really we're sort of at the end of the budget review process and the budget is, was prepared and presented to us on the work that was done. Um, earlier in the year and presented to us on May 3rd. Uh, but I think that um, Sean might be able to give us information about um, the two aspects of cannabis revenue that come in, the community impact fee, what it's permitted to be used for, and the excise tax, which is a, has a broader uh, definite, it, it isn't as limited as community impact fees are by statute for what it can be used for. So that's one aspect of the problem. And then for the revenue tax, um, that was assumed as a revenue stream into the budget as part of the revenue that was then being allocated in the proposed budget. So then the question arises, if the budget were now to be uh, changed by the council um, in some fashion, and really the only thing it could do is to reduce parts of the proposed expenditures for the current year in order to make to to free funds that have um, that were cannabis tax money that were already um, assumed into the budget as revenue, as I understand it, but. Sean's our expert and Paul's the one who's responsible for the budget. So I really need to turn it over to them for um, a response on that. Sure, I can give just sort of a, a general outline of how it's in the current budget, what, what's in the current budget and what's not in the current budget. Um, so the tax revenue, um, not the impact money, but the tax revenue, we budgeted 190,000 of that as sort of a general fund revenue that supports all of the, the town departments. Um, that was a conservative estimate. We brought in, I think about 206,000 the year before, um, but like many of our revenues, we're not sure, we weren't sure how COVID was gonna impact uh, sales in the future. Um, and we also, whether that number will grow. So we've got a, some additional dispensaries that have been added since the 206 number, um, that I talked about since that number came to be. Um, so we don't know if that number is gonna grow in the future or if it's just gonna spread out. 
um, you know, it could theoretically become a, a grow as more dispensaries come online. Um, but that's another reason why we went with a conservative number for what we budgeted. The impact monies, we haven't budgeted any of that. Um, that is essentially equivalent to the tax money. So we brought in about 206,000 of that last year. And that goes into our free cash and our reserves, but that money we have to track because it's restricted in its use. Um, you know, our understanding is that it has to be used on the impacts of marijuana or the dispensaries. Um, however, we are trying to get legal guidance, whether that's the only way it can be used. Um, and those funds as well, um, those funds we have to keep track of. So we have money in our reserves and we've been having have an accounting of what we've received in prior years. I think we received a little bit in FY19, um, some in FY20, and then obviously this year we've received some. And so we're keeping track of that, but none of that money has been used. It's not budgeted for, um, we're, you know, we're thinking about a plan for what it could go towards like education um, or mental health needs in the community. Uh, but to date, none of that has been spent yet. And I think that's about it. I'm happy to answer any questions um, about those sources of funds. Sean. Yes, Mr. Uh, Rhodes. The impact money, uh, is that the impact money coming directly from cannabis sales? Yeah, so that money comes directly to the town from the dispensaries. They pay it directly to us. All right, that's, that's one second. You said tax revenue as of $190,000. Is that as a result of taxing on uh, cannabis sales? Yeah, so they're both, I could, I'm could. i pretty sure they are both roughly 3% of sales, um, but the tax revenue goes through the state and then comes to us on a quarterly basis, um, whereas the impact money comes directly to us from the dispensaries. So you're looking at about $396,000 total in relationship to um, uh, cannabis. Yeah, that would be, again, in FY20, I think we received about a little over 400,000. So that's that's in the right ballpark. And the impact money, uh, $206,000, um, has that been allocated yet through the budget process? Not the impact money, no, not. And um, we've had preliminary discussions about possible uses, but we haven't used any of it to date. Um, again, and that's the money that has some restrictions, or at least what we understand are restrictions is that it has to be used on the impacts of, um, has to be used on things that are related to marijuana or the dispensaries. Um, but again, we're trying to get more information on if there's a broader use that we can, we can put that towards. I know there are some communities that are looking to use that money in different ways, um, more along the lines of what, we, what we're talking about today, um, but we haven't heard if it's been deemed allowable yet. All right, so that's, that hasn't, that hasn't uh, what you're, if I'm hearing you correctly, the use of the impact fees of $206,000 or whatever, uh, that hasn't been de uh, uh, decided by the state as to exactly what that can be used for other than the impacts or the possibility of uh, the siting of uh, the cannabis uh, sales. Yeah, we don't have anything. We, we've got what it's supposed to be used for. We haven't heard of if you use it for something else, you know, where are you going to get, you know, are, are we going to get in trouble if we use it for something else, I think is the piece that um, we haven't have definitive uh, guidance on. So uh, just to be clear, what is it supposed to be used for? So it's supposed to be used for the, um, the impacts that the community feels related to the, the dispensaries or the selling of recreational or medical marijuana. Um, so some of the suggested uses or examples that they throw out there are uh, mental health programs or um, uh, drug education and things like that in the schools. Um, and so those are some of the topics that we've talked about. Some places use it for like infrastructure. If it, you know, if the dispensary creates, um, you know, traffic issues around where the dispensary goes, they've used it for infrastructure needs, um, things like that. All right. Last question. The, so 206,000 hasn't been um, uh, um, allocated to anything, but the 190,000 has mm -hmm. tax revenue. Yeah, so the 190 has been treated like a general fund revenue. So we have, we have as you mentioned, we have lots of revenue streams. Um, and so that's been treated like a general fund revenue, like our uh, our meals tax or our hotel motel um, excise tax. All right, thank you. And I, just as a general comment for somebody who's worked with budgets for quite a long period of time, and Irv was on the uh, finance committee with me. So you've, you've lived with me on some of those years. 
it's always a question as to how we are going to fund the increases that come for year to year and fund new initiatives that the town wants. And that's always a struggle because we know that existing revenue is capped for the most part by political realities of what the state is willing to give us in state aid and proposition two and a half, which limits our increase to two and a half percent unless voters um, approve an override, which in and of itself is a uh, difficult ask to make in any community. Uh, but that puts a, uh, a problem out there because just to maintain level services, there's always gonna be some increase as costs rise. And so uh, generally we're finding that the natural growth um, that comes in budgets is usually two and a half or three percent a year. And it puts pressure on us just to maintain the funding for what we have. Of course, that's why we keep talking about new growth and we keep getting now, or at least now we're getting a lot of pushback from the community that says, uh, gee, but I don't like new growth. And uh, so it, it, it's always this pressure point that comes out there. And I think that's what we're after. The other thing, and uh, Michelle and Matthew uh, and I had a conversation sort of in preparation for this meeting. And what I was pointing out is I have a lot of uh, appreciation and uh, jealousy in some ways for what Evanston, Illinois has done um, because they were able to just say, okay, we'll take our revenue from uh, excise uh, from, from the tax on sale of marijuana and use it for this very specific purpose. But Evanston is not comparable to Amherst in many, many ways. Uh, it's a ring suburb and a wealthy ring suburb just north of Boston. It has a population that's about twice the size of Amherst, but a budget that's probably three and a half times as big as our budget and their budget doesn't include education because it's a separate school taxing school district, which is typical in the Midwest, whereas we have to fund education out of our budget. So when you put all of those factors together, uh, we're just uh, uh, wish we were in the position that Evanston was in, but we have to be realistic. And uh, it's just sort of a reality that our committee has to deal with. You know, Andy, one of the things that, um, you know, when I, when, when I listened to what you just said, Amherst is Amherst. Amherst will always be Amherst and we cannot compare ourselves to any other town or municipality. Uh, we have to de uh, decide upon what roads we wish to, uh, to take and walk. And it seems to me that um, where we are right now, that we can do what we need to do in terms of restorative justice in this town. And that there are really concrete revenue streams that can be applied to this. The only question is, what does the finance committee and the council want to do? The streams, the income streams are there. They are there. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh... That's what we want to do today is explore. Uh, Lynn, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to just say there are other people here who understand municipal finance more than better than I do. And even though I've spent the last two and a half years making sure I understand it. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions and Irv and Michelle and my, Matthew, just be patient with me because I'm trying to get where you're trying to get, okay? Your, your goal is to have a committee that will identify the path or the paths Amherst as a, a town should take, could take in the field of rep reparations. Hold on one second.
Sorry, we we have a little transition on Thursdays in our house. Um, and I'm concerned about the marijuana money for two reasons. One is we've recently seen our town, two towns over, that gets a lot more marijuana money than we did and that we do or probably ever will. Basically, it's just said we're no longer going to charge that extra 3%. And, you know, as we often see, then there's movements that happen. And so that leaves us with this other 3%, and it leaves us with a budget at this point that's, I don't want to say cooked, but it's close to cooked, okay? So how can we get to the point that sometime between now and, you know, early fall, we put on the table the equivalent of $206,000, okay? How can we do that? And Sonia actually came up with a suggestion in a meeting earlier about this, okay? And that is at the end of each year, we usually have, we usually have some unspent money. That goes through a process and we have to vote it as a stabilization fund. Now we could vote $206,000 into a stabilization fund for reparations. That would happen sometime, am I correct? September, October, Sonia? Yes. And at that point, the committee will have met and you'll have started to get some sense of what it is this is gonna do. And we will have already been upfront and said, out of this year's unspent money, this amount would go there. Now, some of that unspent money is bluntly spoken for because that's what is our reserves to do, build new libraries, new schools, new fire stations, and new DPWs and whatever else the town does. So we can't give it all to this, but I think I feel very strongly that we need to have something coming out of this year's budget that puts something on the table in the next 12, next four months, if you will. And that would be my suggestion. And I think it's, I think from, I wanna thank Sonia for coming. So Lynn, just to clarify, that would have to be a, a vote from free cash yeah. for our existing stabilization fund, because that's where the excess flows to our reserves. Thank you. And it would have to be a vote of the council, just like any other financial vote of the council. The two thirds vote from the council to take it out of one stabilization fund and a majority vote to add it into another. It's kind of a little crazy here. It also would take a two thirds vote to, to spend any money from it. So you would have to come up with an appropriation, bring it to council, and there would be a two thirds vote. And that's going to be true with any fund we have. We can't just say, here's a fund, go spend it. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. There's got, there's a process. And Irv, of all the people on working on this, which I am delighted that you are doing that, I have to just lean on the fact that you understand how town finances work so that you understand that this is based on something that happens through a process that we go through every year. I, I do understand that. And uh, Sonia, I, uh, I, I really must applaud you. That's a brilliant idea. Well, I want to... First of all, um, state that really Sean was trying to come up with an idea to do this and it came, he came up with the main idea. I just helped him to understand how it would flow through the accounting. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the, the, the only, the only uh, caveat for us would, would be, all right, if it's $206,000, uh, is there going to be any bleed from that by the time we get to uh, September? Of the two from reserves, no, there's 200. No, right. no bleed. Thank you. Okay. I guess I have one question for Sonia then. Um, if you did something like that, can the council vote in an amount? Uh, for actual expenditure that is outside of the budget, or does it have to then fold back into the budget process 
under the rules that we're currently operating under. It would be a vote from reserves. So budget process is always, um, you're voting uh, a budget on estimated revenues. This would not be estimated revenues. It would be a certified reserve. So it would be a supplement, but it would be, still be a supplemental appropriation. Yes, which could happen at any point in time. Correct. By rule in the charter, that's, that's so. Right. Uh, source. The source is available. Uh, just clarification. Um, I thought that there were two fees on marijuana. One that we would get all the time and that I thought the impact fee was a limited, was a time limited fee for maybe three years, maybe five years. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to want to make sure that people understand that we don't get both of them forever. It's just one of them is forever. And I had a thought, maybe nowhere near as good as what you've come up with, but I, I had the thought of saying, okay, we can donate the impact fee as long as we get it. So that might be, you know, the full amount for three years or four years. Um, because the kind of thing, truthfully, I, you know, I had been hoping that we could come up with some opportunity to help home ownership, um, even though I know that's a complicated topic. But um, anyway, that's my suggestion. Um, Dorothy, at one, at one point, I really would like to sit down with you in terms of that affordable home, home ownership, uh, because that is an area that is of great interest to me. And one of the things that I have always, and I've always um, talked about with some intensity is that I really uh, do not like the notion of always uh, coming up with affordable housing, but we equate it to apartment rental. Right. But we do not equ equate it to home ownership. Right. All wealth. When we look at the wealth of any neighborhood, any 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 area in the United States, calculated into that is home ownership. Totally. So totally. as you get the disparities, I know I'm probably speaking to the, uh, the choir here, but um, it, it is something that we in Amherst have to start doing. And there are pathways to do that. Uh, and there are, you know, are definitely a lot of pathways to do that. And so I, I really want to put that on the table. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd certainly love to have more discussion with you and to learn from you. So thank you. Okay, Pat. Thank you. I don't have a lot to add because of Mr. Rhodes' statements, but I want to say no to the impact fees because it's a limited revenue stream. Um, and we're talking about creating an ongoing revenue stream. If you're interested in either affordable housing or more importantly, home ownership, that is something that a, uh, the black community could decide to do with this money separate from us. And that's what's really important that this is separate from the council, uh, separate from um, the, the white space that we are. And it becomes the, uh, it, it, it sits on the creativity of the community who has been harmed. And I think that it's critical that we move forward with this. Um, I know that there's, uh, there's a, a balancing act going on in terms of the CREST program and other needs of the, our community, all of us. And, but I really, um, think that this is one of the ways that we can, we can repair, we can heal because it's white people need to heal. Maybe <laughs> we've caused this and we also suffer from it. And I think that that's often not acknowledged. I want to hand money over, I, but I, uh, the other piece for me is in terms of what uh, mental health and education uh, as being permitted uses. As someone who um, does, is part of a, a alternative to violence program in a prison, um, I have many friends now in my life and they are real friends who are incarcerated for um, existing as black people in white spaces. And it, se it seems to me that addressing issues of um, 
disproportionate incarceration for the same marijuana crimes needs to be addressed and could be addressed by this. Um, I, I'm repeating what's already been said much better by Mr. Rhodes and Ms. Miller and Mr. Andrews. So I'm gonna stop, but we need to do this. Well, you know, Pat, I agree with you, but uh, what is really important is that using the impact fees and going through the process that has just been explained is that's a meaningful beginning, a very meaningful beginning. And while that is, is limited to maybe two or three years, but within that time frame, uh, the African Heritage uh, Committee will have developed other possibilities uh, by working in um, concert with uh, the Finance Committee and uh, the Town Council. Mm -hmm. But this is a meaningful beginning. Uh, and three years of, of, of $206,000 is really very meaningful and will go a long way. Okay. Uh, Kathy, is your hand up? Thank you. I'm going to try to build on the conversation because um, I too have been thinking since I early spoke to Michelle and listened to the presentations, but also yours on sources of revenue, the impact fee, and I just pulled up the code, may be too restricted for what you want in terms of grabbing it, but that does not mean the solution of pulling something out of um, our reserves is not a possibility. So, it, I, so this notion of it can be anchored just to that. So looking forward, I think that's a discussion we're just gonna have to have because it's got it, it's so closely linked to the community be able to use it directly to things related to marijuana. So if you talked about home ownership and some of the other possible uses, you wanna be at the fee that we collect from marijuana can be used any way we want, which just been allocated in FY22. So beyond the coming year, if you wanna look at FY23 and the future years before we've allocated, that fee is, is, is just money. You know, so it can be a tapped in stream. So I just think that beyond the discussion this morning, this afternoon, we need clarity on how restricted the thing called impact fee is. But we've got a lot of money if we wanted to bring it out of reserves for a specific new use of it that is available. So that doesn't mean that, that this other route is is negated. So 200,000 could be a target amount. So I, I just want to make sure we're on firm ground, not here in the committee. Or if, I'm just saying that it's it's got this list of what it can be used for, and it has to be very direct. Um, so for the kinds of things you're likely to come up of, you'll say, well, there's so little of this that we could fit into this little tiny p uh, piece. Um, but the amount of money is something we're thinking about as a starting point. So I'm just differentiating it on the impact fee-ness of it. It's got, you can use it for a traffic intersection. You can do it uh, cultivation of marijuana. You can do it um, substance abuse and prevention programs. So it, you know, it just, it has it so tightly linked to marijuana, not to broader issues, even of mental health. So. So I just think it's important and we can get you that documentation. So I'm not saying that it's not possible to have money in FY22, but I think what Lynn was describing and Sonia and Sean was, is a potential, potential alternative way of that same amount of money as I understand it. Um, and then by the future years, the revenue flow, and I think that's what Evison, the revenue flow from sales tax on marijuana, that becomes something to look at um, that we could, we, we could, it's well within no state, there's no state provision that stops us as a town from saying how we want to use that money. So I just wanted to distinguish between the two of them. Kathy, can I just add to that real quick? Um, we still have to make sure it's an allowable public purpose or allowable use of public funds, which is the what we're waiting for a legal opinion on what are those allowable uses. So I just want to be clear that it's it's not 
quite as open as the way you described it, but I, I'm not sure it restricts what we're talking about here today either. Um, right. So I, I didn't mean, you know, it wasn't like we can we can use it all to go go take trips somewhere if we we wanted to. But okay, yes. but, that, but it's it's much less restricted. I guess that's the best. Yes, yes that's much a great. That's less a... restricted. It's 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 a revenue flow that the town has and will continue into the future. Right. Yeah. yeah but there is a problem that's additional, which is the anti-aid amendment. And we really, uh, it depends upon what we're doing in the way of reparations and how it's, how it would be structured if we were to do reparations from town funds, but we can't lose sight of the fact that uh, once we've gotten a concept, we have to run that concept uh, by um, town attorney to make sure that we're not violating the anti-aid amendment by what we're doing. And uh, it's a subject that we could be talking about for hours and I don't want to do that. Um, I think that there's uh, some other realities that we have to get to. Uh, one is, is that Sonia, uh, are this started out with the discussion of, excess, of unspent revenue from one year being used to create a fund? Well. We've been successful in building reserves. When Irv and I were together on the old finance committee, the reserves were probably about 8% of the uh, taxation. And now we're over 15%, which was what our goal was, was to be. Uh, but we got there because we did a concerted effort, which was any um, excess revenues above projections and reduced expenditures that were below projections for any given year, we knew would end up in the reserves and we deliberately wanted to build the reserves up to that maximum goal level because of the need that we saw coming down the line for the major building projects. So that's just, Point, reality point one that we have to be bearing in mind and remind the count and explain to the council as they consider all options. And the uh, last thing that I want to point out before going back to the to other people is that uh, we're going to be hearing this evening about um, community services working group recommendations. We have a lot of other demands upon our uh, what town resources that are above and beyond what the town resources are. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just another thing that at least needs to be borne in mind as we go through this. So I'm going to go back in order to where uh, hands are up uh, and just take it in order. Lynn, you're, you're next. I, the goal in this case of the suggestion that came from Sonia with Sean's help was to come up with an amount equivalent, but not hide with all of the restraints of the marijuana money. So it's a way of using a financial marker, but not having the financial constraints. Now, all of that also there are issues like the anti-aid amendment and stuff like that that need to be worked out. But this committee hasn't even been formed yet. And so as it's formed and as it comes up with its ideas, parallel to that, Paul and his staff can be working on making sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing legally and so forth. But I feel like it's so important for us to make this statement to make it in an amount equal to what people have been talking about, but not do it in a way that ties their hands with, oh, maybe we can do this, but we can't do this. That's not the way we want to start this conversation in Amherst. It's the way we want to, we want to proceed with a open book that says we could do this or we could do that, or with private money match, this could happen. Let's not start with restricted money. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, Athena, could you bring uh, 
Alyssa Brewer into the meeting um, and uh, so that I can recognize her in a few minutes. So uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, Matthew, you, you had something you wanted to... Yeah, um, I just want to first presence the fact that the fact that this conversation is happening with such sincerity and uh, a desire to make something happen is historic and heartening. Um, and I also, uh, when I made the presentation to the town council last Monday, one of the things I mentioned was the fact that one of the primary harms of the past few hundred years, uh, well, the past hundred years, let's say, against black people has been opportunity theft and specifically the opportunity to build intergenerational wealth. And in some ways you could see the town reserves as the town's accumulated wealth. And to begin, you know, to have the, the initial contribution, the starting point for um, a process of repair be linked to that, I think is appropriate. Um, and, you know, and the scale of opportunity theft that black people have suffered is so massive that this will, you know, this will have to be a starting point as far as, uh, uh, you know, a, a process. But it sounds like everybody's on the same page about that. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that alignment with Lynn's suggestion. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Shall do anything to add uh, I want to make sure that I can get to uh, Bernie Kubiak, who's a member of the committee, and Alyssa Brewer, who had asked to make a comment, but you had... You'd Very quickly, asking. yeah, just to say, I think we have somebody that wanted to speak in public comment, and Claire um, should be there in public comment, and so I just, I, I, I didn't know if there was a separate space for that, but I know she's been waiting, so... Yeah, I will come back to public comment in a minute. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I want to um, recognize um, Bernie and then um, uh, ask, um, recognize Melissa because she had asked to be recognized earlier. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, just to, I guess I'm, I'm looking at maybe the same document um, that Kathy was looking at. I would just echo that we should forget about the impact fee. Uh, as a route for this. It's just much too specific. And it's likely disposable as, you know, as competition increases, there's going to be increasing pressure. It's already, it's already been uh, attacked in some communities. Uh, I like the idea of using some of the tailings from the current fiscal year, setting those aside. Uh, those would make their appearance probably in the early fall, if I'm, when our free cash is certified, if I'm correct. Um, so that's, putting a marker down and giving uh, this committee and the town manager the opportunity to come up with a uh, permanent source of, of, of revenue for this. I'd also like the, uh, I like the idea that my, my former boss, Mr. Rhodes, uh, is thinking in terms of housing, maybe soft seconds or some other program like that, uh, that could really help people uh, build wealth and would encourage him to, and his, his colleagues to look at ways that we might do things in, an, in a non-financial way as well, in terms of reparations. So we have a broad range of choices for people. So that's it. Okay, well, thank you, Bernie. Melissa, did you uh, wanna speak or have you withdrawn that request? If I could very briefly, that would be wonderful. Please. So obviously this is not delivered. Thank you so much. Obviously, this is not deliberation. I know you guys have a ton to do. I just want to reiterate, I guess where we're at now is reiterating what Bernie said, which is, I want to be perfectly clear with Pat and Dorothy, who, of course, I understand haven't been working on legalized marijuana impact fees and every the bylaws that were developed, the regs that were developed the way I have from the beginning in Amherst. And the impact fees are off the table. It's completely irrelevant to this conversation, not usable for the things that you're talking about using. And so I, when we talk about this, as a couple of other people have since said, the amount of money that you're talking about 
is the equivalent to the excise tax. It's not the amount of money that's equivalent, which so happens to be equivalent to the impact fee. But if you go around telling people that we are going to be able to use the impact fee, we are going to get in trouble. <laughs> so that's not how the impact fee works. I guarantee that it's not a maybe we can, it doesn't. And so I just appreciate you letting me say that. And just in terms of, again, pe managing people's expectations and explaining things clearly. It just so happens the two numbers are equivalent. It's not that impact fee is accessible by reparations or community safety working group or literally anything else, except for the very few things that are on that document. Well, thank you, Alyssa. And just so that everybody knows, Alyssa and I, of course, surfed on the select board together back when this whole marijuana uh, law was passed and the discussion started. And uh, Alyssa really was the select board expert and point person on the uh, development of an understanding about what the marijuana policies and rules and laws were and to guide us as a select board in working with the town manager to develop the initial uh, plans, including the uh, agreements with the uh, um, sales dispensaries to bring in community impact fees. So I very much appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Paul, you had something? Yeah, I just want to be clear about the process. So, um, and I think, you know, Alyssa's right, you don't want to be talking about community impact fee. What you would be doing, and Sonia and Sean can correct me, you would create a stabilization fund for reparations every year or whenever you want, you can allocate funds when free cash is certified from your reserves based on some policy that the council adopts, you would vote to put those funds into the stabilization fund and then they would live, they'd be separately accounted for in that stabilization fund. And then when there's a project or some proposal that comes, it would be presented to say, we wanna take some money from that stabilization fund and spend it on for this purpose. And it has to be a legal purse it. We have to follow procurement, do all the things that we have to do. It's, a, it's still public money. So, but there's a process where you set up the stabilization fund. You, the council can have a policy to appropriate funds into that separate fund that, and then you would have a process to take money out of that for whatever purposes. Is it, Sonia, is that, sorry, capture it? Yes. I like the legal, has to be legal and allowable. Uh, Irv? Well, you know, one, one of the things that I am quite sure of is that we can um, put together a process and procedures and a program to be able to utilize the funds that uh, Sean and Sonia have identified uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, I also know that there are other possibilities. And now that I know that we have a, a such incredibly creative financial minds here, I look forward to working with Sean and Sonia as this process goes forward. I just kind of say one thing, uh, Mr. Rhodes was the uh, school committee chair the first year I started here. <laughs> you, you probably don't remember me, Mr. Rhodes, but I, I, was, a, you, I, was, a, I was a budget analyst that year. And so uh, you he, he was 12 a, years old then. Yeah. <laughs> you, gave, you gave me an intro to, uh, to uh, town politics at the, that time. And I, and I just want to clarify that Sean's the creator one. I just make sure he does it right. Um, so we have a couple of people who um, have their hands raised on public comment. Um, so what I, I want to make sure that we get the public comment fairly quickly. So one of them is uh, Alyssa. So I don't know if Alyssa, if you meant to leave your hand up or not, but in any event, uh, we have one other person who uh, and I, the, the Phoenix would bring you in. And then Andy, could I, I just to say one short thing. I have a very hard stop at four o'clock because I have a sixth grader coming to work on a resolution for council. Um, and I need to do that. So I am going to go out at four exactly. Yeah, no, I'm going to try and see if we can uh, wrap up at uh, by four because we need a break before. Um, 
So Andy, Kathy did, and then uh, I'm gonna ask for public I just have, I have a really quick question um, and this is for the future for the team that's presenting. If we have a stabilization fund earmarked for this with this title and private and grant money becomes available from foundations, can it be added to that fund? Can it be, yes. So, so this, I mean, so there would, I'm not saying you could just do it, but so this could be broader than just the town if there were ways of doing that. Is, is that true? Yeah, I mean, we'd have to work out the logistics, but we could, the town can accept donations for specific purposes. Um, but we, I'm not sure if we can make a deposit directly into the stabilization fund or not. Sonia, do you have thoughts on that? It would have to be voted into it. Right. And okay. grants, grants, probably not. Grants have to stay within the grant right. fund from there. So I don't, I don't foresee being able to put any grant money in there, but donations, you can. Okay. So thank you. That was my question. Okay. Um, Lynn, can you wait and let us uh, hear from Claire Bertrand? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Claire, you had, uh, we had asked, uh, said we would want public comment and you're the one person who's has to be recognized. If there's others, they should raise their hand. But Claire, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So I would just like to encourage the town to be bold, to answer this clarion call and to fund reparations. I appreciate so much hearing all of you and the creative work you are doing to try to fund it. Um, I serve on the Amherst A Better Chance ABC board. We bring young men of color to live here and attend our excellent high school. For 50 years, Amherst has shown its commitment to this program. Many of you perhaps have served on the board as well. I know Irv has. Our values are that we lift up these young men of color. It's a longstanding commitment this community has. And 50 years ago, I can imagine, I was very young, but I can imagine that the ABC program as presented was a leap of faith in our community. And I think that's where we are now. We have evolved. We are understanding the need for atonement. The BIPOC community deserves our respect reparations is one step in that direction. So let us not waver. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Lynn, no, I said it. Uh, yes, my, uh, I have a very simple request and that is that when we start our meeting on the, I guess it's the first, when we actually make our recommendations to the council, uh, that we ask our finance and our town manager to make sure that we have properly worded a motion that is captures the spirit of this discussion so that none of us that are not financial uh, wizards out there, uh, we ask our financial wizards to help us uh, prepare the right motion. That's all. Well, thank you. Actually, that's a good segue into the final agenda item unless there's more to be said right now on the subject of finding a funding stream for reparations. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to put a thought out there and that is the development on Belchertown Road might be an opportunity to change the model from rental to home ownership. And that might be something the committee would like to, should consider. Uh, interesting suggestion. I don't know if, our, you know if the staff has any comment about whether that's something that could even be considered. But uh, I think that's probably going to be one that needs some thought. But thank you for raising the issue. Um, Dorothy? I just want to back up that with total support. I had asked that question earlier. Uh, again, I don't know the answer and it may be very complicated, but instead of only building rental affordable housing, 
that's a nice piece of land. We could possibly do home ownership as an opportunity there. Uh, and again, I can't comment without getting some advice. Just not place today. So what I was um, to finish out on what I was saying because it's the, the last agenda item was sort of the process going forward for the finance committee on all of our issues, and uh, I'm struggling on the. Uh, on the finance committee report, appreciate all that we have received so far from those of you, Dorothy and library. Kathy was going to do some possible revisions, I think, on one that she had done with the police department. I think Pat has done one on fire. Um, and I've done several on community services functions that we had heard about previous to today's. So uh, they are working. Uh, progress when it comes to the discussion that we're going to have on the first what we want to do is go through each section of the budget and uh, just uh, see if there's anybody who is making any motion to reduce a portion of the proposed budget um, either in total or in part because um, we have to remember what the uh, charter allows us to do and what state law allows us to do. And uh, that will allow us to then reach a conclusion and encompass a final motion. I think there's a second motion that Lynn was referring to, and that is going to be a subject that uh, her suggestion was that if possible, staff come up with uh, some sort of uh, proposed motion for the committee to consider at the meeting on the first that uh, addresses the issue that we started with and it was that was charged to us by the council at the May 17th meeting regarding reparations. So that's the process that I envision. Um, I don't know if there's any comments from anyone uh, who's participating in this meeting presently about that is a process to move forward with on, uh, on the first. And the other thing that we would do, uh, we posted a second meeting for uh, the second of uh, June, which is the day after the meeting on the first. Not that we think that we need it, but, but in case we need it, because we're charged with making a recommendation on the budget within 30 days of referral. 30 days of referral um, is the second. And so I think we need to have voted by the second and at least send some sort of uh, report by email to the council uh, on the evening of the second uh, after uh, if we have to have that additional meeting. So we posted an additional meeting, but I hoping that we actually complete business on the first and don't need to have that additional meeting. So, um, Sean, you have anything to say? Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify expectations around the, the reparations piece. So what I'm thinking is the motion for that would be to create the stabilization fund. Um, and then the, uh, the memo that goes along with it will lay out sort of what we talked about because the motion to appropriate funds won't come until pre cash is certified in the fall. Um, but we could potentially bring forward the motion to create the fund and, and then explain sort of what we discussed and what the plan is for that fund. Does that sound consistent with what we talked about? Yes. Okay. I think, I think it does, but others will uh, respond as if they have their hands up, but thank you. Kathy? Uh, yeah, Andy, um, I'm comfortable with what you laid out, and I'm just trying to do my 30-day count. So if we have a long meeting tonight, um, if out of that comes, I don't know what is going to come out of that, but if we have a longish section that has to be written to explain what we're thinking, I don't see how you will have written that by... Um, Tuesday, but maybe you will perform wonders when we can get you our amended sections. So 
when you said um, we could get something specific back to the council that's on recommendations, but not necessarily a report and or maybe the report will be done. That's, I'm just looking at counting. Do we, do we wanna move the third to the second on a tentative, maybe we need to meet, or do you think we really can get everything done on the first? Because it sounds like we can't be reviewing a report and wording on the third uh, in terms of your timeline. Um, actually, what I, uh, what I think that we can do and Athena is um, our arbiter as far as uh, what, what we have to do to comply with the charter. I think we can report back in a brief report, uh, the, even one that's sent by email only, saying what it is that our bottom line recommendations are, explanations to follow, so that we have reported to the council on our recommendations within the 30 day period. And then we can take a little bit of extra time if we need to, to actually write a report to go along with the recommendations. Um, so that was, Sonia? I just wanna throw a little something in here. The setting up the stabilization fund and appropriating any money into it does not have to happen for this budget season for the, for the budget, the main budget that can be separate and that can wait a couple of weeks. So you can get your schedule a little clearer. That can happen at any point in time. It does not have to happen before June 1st. Um, no, I realize that it's not a part of the budget. Um, I think, and I have to go back, but maybe Lynn will remember that there was a time deadline on the motion that uh, Alyssa made um, and was seconded and passed by the council. I think it. I think what it is, it's part of the spirit of the budget, and so we want some motion uh, that is done at the same time we pass the budget. So that it is the marker is there, and I the only other thing I would besides the fact that we would set up that stabilization fund uh, would be language that says something that with the intent that you know a amount equivalent to that piece of the marijuana money would be um, deposited in that fund at the time we do our stabilization overall budget somehow or another we can work on it Sonny. well i suggest that we create if, if you want to do something for the budget time that we create the stabilization fund so that it's there to show mm -hmm. good faith and i think i think um we should take a little time to figure out exactly what the funding source will be for that or what we're doing I, that's just my suggestion it just feels like we need to work out the logistics I don't know. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're hearing the intent. I think you know, we once we develop the stabilization fund, I think we want to have a policy of the town council to say this is how we're going to fund it, um, and this is the the source of revenues that we're looking at. We're going to take percentage based on the revenue. So I, I do think you want to spend some time in thinking about this because we want this to be going forward as a policy of the of the council, basically. Right. I do think we also have to remember that each deposit has to be separately voted by a majority of the council at the time that it's made. So, you know, two years from now, three years from now, whoever's on the council will always have to, the, that council will always have to vote to add money to a stabilization fund. And it requires a two thirds vote of the council to withdraw money from a stabilization fund. So when a proposal is made by whatever mechanism is established, um, it still requires that two thirds vote of the council to allocate money from the stabilization fund for the purpose. It just feels like a time crunch, that's all to me. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I so had one comment, I'm... and it was related to the whole other piece of our final 
business, and that is I thought we had agreed to meet on the first and if necessary, the second, that we're not meeting on the third. That's what I thought. Yeah, and I think that's right. And that's why I phrased it that if we need a sec separate meeting on the second, that's something we can decide. I just wanted to remind, to tell people that we posted a meeting. Remember, we're going into a holiday weekend so that posting uh, is actually a little bit more complicated because you can't count Monday as part of the 48 hours for posting notice. But then we need to post the-, the Athena, I think Athena did post the second. Uh, okay. We can double already posted the yeah. first and the second. Okay, great. Thank you. And we've already gone over the agendas and they're, they're good for what we want. So they, they, they did get posted today. So, uh, Dorothy, you had something to conclude? So, um, two comments. The first is the fund is not really a pass through fund where we get money, we put it in, and that's the only money you take out. It's that you get money, you put it in one pocket, and you remember how much it was, but you could take it out of another pocket to pay it. Is, is, is that correct, Sonia? No. No, the money goes into the fund and it gets, and then it gets transferred to a, an account to spend it from. All right, so we don't, we're not concerned about any restrictions on the, um, the tax. I thought, I thought there was some concern even about the general marijuana. Money. It's, it's not linked that way. We're okay. not using any marijuana. That's, what I, that's fine. That, I just want to make sure that's clear. Okay. We're using the amount equivalent to. Right. That's, that's what I meant. I, was, I, was, I explained my metaphor okay. was not a good one, but that's what I wanted to establish, that it was separate. Okay, I just, I wanted to say thank you to um, uh, Michelle and um, to Matthew for their presentations and their thoughtful and creative ways of discussing things with us. Um, so I hope that we can continue to work together. Thank you. I too want to thank Michelle and Matthew and Irv for having been with us today and for the comments we've received. Uh, and I, I just want to add Irv because Irv has such a long history that having someone come in who's actually been part of these finance discussions plus is a leader in the community is terrific. Thank you. Thank you Irv. Irv, thanks for coming out of retirement. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we need to adjourn so that we can reconvene at 530 and have some time in between. And uh, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, in any event, um, if any other uh, final business on this uh, first part of the meeting, if not, I will uh, declare this meeting adjourned and we will reconvene with our second meeting at 530. See you later.